Good evening. I believe we're still waiting for a couple of commissioners to connect. And I just resent the link. So it's the first thing they see in their box if they're looking for it. Thank you. Good evening, gentlemen. Rebecca. Good evening. How's your, uh, how's your pneumonia, Craig? Yeah. Uh, pretty much better. Still a little bit of a trace cough, but all the all the fever and all that stuff is long gone now. Absolutely. So thank you. Good to hear. <laughs> Director Malika. Hello, Chair. Sorry, my computer was having issues logging in today. <laughs> We're good. <clears throat> it says that I cannot start my video for whatever it's worth. Hmm. Happens to the best of us. Let me check. Uh, let me check on Prime Gov again. Oh, there you go. As long as we can see the surfboard, we're good. <laughs> uh, I'm going to mute and give Commissioner or Vice Chair Mazza a quick call. There he is. Hey, Skyler. Uh -oh. You guys with the fancy new processors that allow your Zoom video, the background to be blurry. Mine doesn't have that feature. Really? Yeah, the graphics card won't keep up or something. I don't know. So it's it's your computer, not the not the program. Yes, it's a yeah, it's a MacBook, but it's a couple of years old. So uh. there you go. <clears throat> I ordered some old timey Malibu posters and they should be in this week. So I'm just going to put those behind me. Oh, there you go. Um, Alex and Parker, is there a way, uh, Vice Chair Mazza is present in the meeting under the identity Robbie today? Is there a way to enable his video without him signing in under his own email? I just saw a screen message saying Robbie is now the co-host. We could just rename Robbie to John Mazza if that's John Mazza. That is the case, and that would be super helpful if you could. Okay, that's no problem. And can you see if you can enable your video now? There he is. There I go, I think. Perfect. Thank you. I'm not moving. I'll access the lab. You're on, John. It looks frozen. There, there we go. go. For some reason, the, the link wouldn't work. Okay. Um, Chair, I believe you're ready to go. Okay. Counting heads. We got everybody here, it looks like. So here we go. Good evening, friends and neighbors. I would like to call to order the Malibu Planning Commission regular meeting date of May 1st, 2023. Happy birthday, Lauren. This meeting is being held by teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Commissioners and city staff are participating in this Zoom meeting for remote locations. All votes will be taken by roll call. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org front slash virtual meeting. At the screen, at that screen, click on one of two tabs to either watch or to sign up to speak on particular items. Those wishing to speak must be present in the Zoom meeting to be recognized. Please sign up before the item has been called by the chair. Those wishing to defer time to someone else intending to speak are not required to sign up, but must be present in the meeting. If instead of speaking, you wish to donate your time to another speaker, please click the raise hand button at the bottom of your Zoom screen when the public hearing for the item is open. A speaker may accept up to five additional minutes, one minute from each speaker that defers time for a maximum total of eight minutes. Alex, would you show the slide, please? Very nice. Commissioners, when you have comments, please raise your hand and I will call on you 
in turn so we can make our discussion clear for the record and for the public. And by the way, that was that was Lauren Doyle, whose birthday is today. Uh, may I have a roll call, please? Commissioner Hill? Here. Commissioner Jennings? Here. Commissioner Peek? <laughs> Vice Chair Mazza? Here. Chair Smith? Yeah, here. You have a quorum. Wonderful. Um, approval of the agenda. Uh, Chairman, I make a motion to approve the agenda as staff recommends and to move item 4A to the last position and 5A to a date uncertain. And the reason for 4A moving is I am recused on that item. And, um, you know, as things have gone on, and I've looked at this 100 times, I, I too have to recuse myself on 3A1. So right off the bat, I'll take mine first and take a chance that it won't take too long or however that goes, but um, I will uh, I'll recuse myself on 3A1. Is everybody in agreement on Vice Chair Mazes? I'll second the motion. Okay. Okay. Uh... Dennis, you've got to unfortunately shut yourself off um, for about one minute. Uh, I will make it, what? Oh, go ahead, Vice Chair Mazza. Yeah, let's go ahead and, and, and handle the agenda first. Go ahead, sir. Okay, I was, uh, does he have to recuse himself by shutting off, or can I just make a motion to uh, approve that one item? Perfect. Yeah, we can, we can, everyone can vote. No one needs to turn off any video right now in approving the agenda. If item 3A1 is pulled from the consent calendar, then yes, Chair Smith will have to go through the normal um, uh, recusal process, turn off the camera, turn off the audio, and we'll go ahead and text him or reach out to him individually when it's his time to come back on. Chair, okay. would you like me to call the roll? Uh, well, what? Yeah, we haven't made a motion yet. Uh, you, I, I thought so you made did. a motion to approve the agenda and oh, seconded by Commissioner Jennings. Uh, so, Vice Chair Mazza? Yes. Commissioner Jennings? Yes. Commissioner Hill? Yes. Commissioner Peek? Yes. Chair Smith? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. And then, then, then we just go on back to you, right? Yeah, for, for the moment, uh, Vice Chair, yes. So, we have written in our all communications from the public. Communications from the public concerning matters which are not on the agenda, but for which the Planning Commission has subject matter jurisdiction. The Commission may not act on these matters except for to refer the matters to staff or schedule the matters for a future agenda. Do we have any speakers? Rebecca. Uh, yes, we do. Well, let me refresh my screen. We had a speaker here a moment ago. <laughs> Let me see if I see her in the meeting. Um, okay, Joe Drummond uh, is has signed up in advance to speak this evening. If there are other members of the public present in the meeting who wish to speak and have not signed up to do so, please click the raise hand button while she's providing her comments. Hi there. I was going to have a video in response to John Mazza at the last meeting asking if the commissioners have a conflict of interest in their position. If they have, if you have a video, I'd love to play it and talk with it. So this planning commission noted with the the this um, project, he'll talk about it. Oh, there should be volume. Maybe there isn't. Alex and Parker, um, is there volume enabled for this? I heard a little bit here, Mayor, uh, uh, members of the council. Uh, the matter before you tonight is an appeal of the Planning Commission's denial of a coastal development permit for a single family residence at 6701 Ports Head Road. Here is the aerial photograph and vicinity map uh, of the project site, which is a vacant residential lot located in the Point Doom residential neighborhood. The site's topography descends from Ports Head Road towards a stream 
located at the rear of the property and develop will, development will occur on the flattest portion of the site closest to the street. The proposed project consists of a new 7,314 square foot two-story residence with an attached three car garage and a detached pool house, including a new on-site wastewater treatment system. The project includes a site plan review to allow portions of the residence and pool house trellis to exceed 18 feet in height up to 24 feet. Uh, however, the Planning Commission determined that two of the required findings for site plan review could not be made. More specifically, finding number two in that the project adversely affects neighborhood character and finding five in that the project is not consistent with the general plan and LCP. The commission placed a, a weight on the size of the residence and found the project to be too large and incompatible to the neighborhood. Since the site plan uh, review cannot be approved, the commission determined that the project is not consistent with the general plan and LCP. The planning commission noted with this 8,900 square foot project that the 50 homes adjacent averaged only 29. Uh, yes. Mayor Peak. Yes. Motion carries. To reverse the Planning Commission's denial for the project at 6701 Portishead. Here is the resolution dated January 10th, 2018. It is approved and signed by Mayor Skyler Peak. There should be strong rules for who can be appointed given that we have here coming up the electrical permit applied for and signed by Skyler Peak for the same project. Four years later, on January 14, 2022. We all know it takes years to build after an approval, so the length of time between should not matter. There's the electrical permit. And um, I guess this is Skylar Peak's work truck parked outside of 6701 Portishead in 2022. Apparently there have been other unscrupulously approved projects by Skylar Peak when he was on city council, such as the EIR for Bluffs Park development on September 11, 2017, and in the Wagner affidavit for approving his friend Richard Sperber's project that same year, which had grading variations, violations, as well as trying to block the purchase of a property at Civic Center. Here is the approval decision for 6847 Wildlife Drive, owned by Richard Sperber, which you see the vote of three yes, two no, which shows Peak's vote made a huge difference on this project. Thank you. Thank you. And I don't see any other hands raised for public comment on items not currently on the agenda. If you'd like to move close the public comment portion of the hearing. Okay, I guess we'll close the public comments. Um, commissioners, Vice Chair Maza. Uh, Couple of things. I uh, I don't know. I think my name was used in that. I don't think it had anything to do with it. But uh, um, last meeting we had what uh, what Greg uh, reported a what I consider not being a lawyer an inappropriate offer made to a planning commissioner, and. Um, we got no reaction from our city attorney or anybody else. So I would like to hear from our city attorney what the city does in situations like that um, and how they should be handled in the future. Sure, so Chair, do you mind? No, oh, please. Absolutely, so we, our office heard that. We are currently in the process of looking into it um, that is multifaceted. I can't really get into too many of the specifics and or details. Um, as for moving forward, the, you know, I don't want to necessarily say there's a best way to handle it. Um, reaching out to our office or Director Mollica or, or Mr. City Manager is, is always an option as well, or making it known here during the, uh, during the public hearing, um, I guess, is, is also an option. So that's kind of what, where we stand today. Okay. Is that it, Vice Chair? That's it. Okay. Um, Commissioner Danny, oh, uh, Commissioner Hill, you have your hand up. Yeah, uh, whatever order. I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not particular. Um, I don't know what, what there is I can say about what I just heard there. Nobody's talked to me about it, so I don't know. Um, two things. 
one we just got today uh, in our email probably everybody i'm guessing a photograph or two of the uh tower at civic center at the college at the, the sheriff's substation that's it's now growing it's the, the 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 leaves are sprouting uh it's getting bigger um you know unless there's a going to be a swimming pool under that and it's going to be the high dive it looks like it's set up for about three dozen potential antennas on there so um i thought there was progress towards getting something more reasonable there but it, uh, i'm not sure that's happening so it'd be good to get an update secondly tonight we don't have any rooftop decks in front of us so i thought this would be a good moment to just um clarify maybe some of my concerns about them in general and to point out that as far as i look at it not all decks are created equal some may have more impact on neighbors some may have impact on wildlife um and i've, I've raised the issue of privacy and how we have uh privacy laws embedded in the general plan and privacy in this case with the rooftop deck i think it's not so much about lighting because we have figured out how to control that pretty well with the ordinance uh, but it is about sound and presence human presence sound projects further and louder when it's up on a platform traveling unimpeded by walls or shrubbery or whatever and privacy presence is also about line of sight both seeing and being seen and whatever the visual equivalent of eavesdropping is and so it seems to me you know we don't have a law against these but there's a question of scale that we should be sensitive to that um you know you know in some cases it might be appropriate to have room for a few couples or a family to enjoy the sunset um you know maybe 100 square feet or less versus enough area to accommodate a loud party uh, of you know many dozens or a hundred and so in terms of scale we should be considering things analogous to viewing platforms balconies or widows walks not party and event spaces um, another analogy is that the building code exempts tree houses of up to 64 square feet i'm not saying a rooftop deck should be categorically limited to 64 square feet but that's one touchstone that um you know these 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 things should be private and personal and family level and not things that can be turned into party spaces. So those are my comments. Thanks. Okay. Commissioner Jennings. Uh, no, I don't have anything to respond to any of this. Commissioner Peake. Um, well, I would like to uh, stop wasting everyone's time with coming after myself and other people that work in the construction business with the innuendo of somehow thinking that we are uh, prevented from working on a project uh, after it's approved and whether that project being approved by us somehow influences our decision or that our decision making is influenced by that when we have no knowledge that we will be estimating or working on a project at some point in the future that would prevent myself as an electrical contractor um, anybody with a, a legal construction consulting background or anything like that from serving and on this planning commission or on the city council so uh Directly in response to your comment, Joe, about the project on Portshead, I think it's super awesome of the new owner to use a local contractor like myself and others to work on the project. Um, had no knowledge that I would ever be working on that project when that was decision was approved at the city council. There are numerous other houses on Point Doom on lots that are smaller than that, that are larger than that. They may not be within that vicinity, but I think that if you have a property that's that large and you want to make a house that's that size, our code allows for it. And that's why that decision was made at that time. Um, so the fact that the project I work for a different owner was not the owner at the time of that, um, had no knowledge that I would be ever asked to bid or work on that project. 
Um, I think it's completely ridiculous that you and other people continue to bring it up and that it's uh, insinuated that that somehow uh, influenced my decision to approve it. Similarly, um, I have been in this community my entire life. I know a lot of people in this community and I have a lot of friends and acquaintances in this community. And just because somebody's a friend of mine doesn't mean that I would have to recuse myself from voting on a project when that relationship has no influence over my decision on that project. And I think it's very important that myself and everybody else that sits here or on the city council looks at the rules and laws of our municipal code, LIP, LCP, et cetera, and applies those as they see accordingly to whatever project is before them. So with that being said, I will continue to do that. And I absolutely appreciate it um, as a contractor. And I think it's smart for people to hire people that are local. So that is all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, well, of course, I'm going to say amen to that. I, I, uh, I'm a contractor on the planning commission and I'm very honored by that. And I would never step out and do anything that would hurt my being here. Um, you know, to ruin what my uh, appointee, Paul Grisante, had put the faith in me to sit here with all of you and, and our fair city. So you can count on me never putting myself in that position as well. So so I think uh, I, hopefully that's that's the last we hear about that because Skyler's not going to do anything like that. And I'm not either. So there you go. All right. Um, Director Malika. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, tonight, uh, I'm going to allow the city, or not allow, he's my boss. I, and the city manager would like to speak. So I, I will be introducing him, and here he is, and I'll let Steve have it. Well, thank you, Richard. I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, thank you, Chair Smith, members of the uh, Planning Commission. Uh, thank you for your time tonight. I know you've got a, a long agenda, so I promise I will try to be brief. Uh, wanted to just check in. I don't usually come and speak to this group, um, but uh, I, I know um, we all kind of watch what other folks are doing. Um, I think one thing I just wanted to to, uh, to highlight for you um, is uh, the great progress that I think we've been making uh, in terms of uh, just the functionality and flow and tone of our city council meetings. Uh, over the past few months, I think the city council and staff have been uh, working really hard together, uh, increasingly uh, uh, to, to uh, work towards uh, more business-like meetings um, and more efficient. Uh, and I think as a result, we've, uh, we've been able to get a lot done uh, and everybody is working together well. I don't think uh, it's any uh, surprise uh, to the folks here uh, that we uh, are struggling uh, with just staffing in general, uh, trying to retain uh, and uh, and attract, uh, you know, the good people who get the work done uh, day to day. Uh, I think, you know, uh, and many of you do, that the staff here are really an amazing collection of uh, dedicated professionals, uh, and they work very, very hard here. Uh, I would just like to urge... Um, not only for the for the staff, but for the members of the commission, uh, that you really uh, work together as best that you can. Uh, treat treat each other respectfully at all times, to the best of your ability. Uh, we certainly understand that there's going to be disagreements, differences in philosophies, and differences of opinions. Uh, we don't expect you to all agree, uh, and we certainly do not expect you to agree with the staff all the time. Uh, and we also feel that uh, your vote is your vote. Uh, and that is absolutely sacred. I would like to point out to the uh, plan commissioners, uh, and it might uh, be good for you to take a look. I'm not going to read through it tonight, uh, but you do have a resolution on the books. Uh, it's 1259. Uh, it talks about plan commission decorum. Uh, it gives rules not only for the commission, but also for the staff and also for the public. Uh, so, as I said, um, you know, we are working to what we can do on our on the management side of things to address what we can to to really assist the staff. I think also hopefully to you know assist the city the planning commission, the city council in carrying out the functions to the best of their ability. 
I'm sure the commission is aware of the work that we're doing uh, with the report for Baker Tilly. Uh, we should have the results on that back um, in a month or so, and we're very much looking forward to the recommendations that we'll receive in that report. Um, as you know, we're working to address the short-term staffing as well as the long-term staffing needs here. Uh, we're also working to address what we know or is really a, a long overdue uh, overhaul of our of our IT and our permitting processes. So those are things that we are working on on our end to, uh, to hopefully make things just better for everybody all around. Uh, also wanted to note that we've got uh, Brown Act training coming up at the end of the month, uh, and you're all invited to that. Uh, we're also going to just be covering some, some general topics as well, just to, to hopefully, um, you know, further give commissioners um, the tools that they need. And um, just if there's anything that the commission feels that they need from myself or my staff that we can do to help support you and your mission, I would be certainly, um, certainly would, uh, would love to hear from you uh, from on that. Um, so again, I just want to thank you for your time and I'd be happy to answer any questions and I'll turn it back over to, uh, to chair Smith. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Sure. Very much. Um, director Malika. Yes. Thank you chair to respond to commissioner Hills inquiry about the Santa Monica college tower. Uh, there still is a stop work order in place. Uh, We've been monitoring them to make certain that no antennas are installed and no further work unless it's safety related on the tower. The applicant, uh, the which is the college on behalf of the county, they have made, as I, I've mentioned in the past, a conditional use permit application that will be coming to this hearing for use of the tower. To date, we've issued two incomplete letters. I, I believe those are also publicly available on our website. As part of that process, we've explained to them that the color and the height of the tower needs to be addressed as well. And that uh, color, it's my understanding that they are making a new application to the FAA that would address the color and lighting. And then in terms of the height, we've given them the option of either lowering it uh, back to what the resolution spec'd out as the height of approval or the option is if they wish, they can make an application to come to this commission for a variance. Uh, to date, the county has not provided us with an application or an app, uh, well, I'll say it's an application for a variance or an application or materials to tell us they're lowering the height of the tower. Uh, we will continue to push on that, uh, but uh, just to reiterate the Conditional use permit that is in process will be coming to this commission. It's also appealable to the city council. So there will be a public hearing on this matter. And with that, uh, the last announcement that I have, and I'm looking on the screen here for Jessica. Oh, there she is, Jessica Bobbitt, is I'm very sad to say that Jessica today has uh, filed with the city her notice. Uh, she'll be leaving us. And Jessica, I don't want to mess this up. Is it Palace Verdes? Yeah, City of Branches, Palos Verdes. There we go, Rancho Palos Verdes. And so we will uh, be losing her. Uh, however, you know, uh, there are some new faces coming to the department in terms of assistant planners. And we also are unfortunately going to be losing, uh, learned on Friday, one of our admin ladies. So we'll be working to fill those positions. Uh, but Jessica, I'll let you speak because I know you wanted to thank these guys for the experience. Uh, yes, thank you, Richard. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, now that I've worked with the city of Malibu about eight years, I actually started as an intern in 2014, um, and I've had such an invaluable experience. And, and first, I would really like to thank Richard Mollica and Adrian Fernandez um, for all of their mentorship um, and really helping me grow uh, professionally here in the planning department and at the city. And then I just wanted to also thank the commission for all the time and uh, spent here and I've learned a lot and it's been such a valuable experience working here. So I really appreciate that and appreciate everyone's time. Thank you. We're going to miss you. You're one of the, one of the better people the city's had, Jessica. We, um, you've been here a long time. You've got all this knowledge. It's just a shame that we're going to lose you for all the right reasons of who you are first and, um, and what you, what you've given uh, and, and to us all and, and your hard work. So 
I, I, along with everyone, I'm sure I wish you all the best. You're going to, you're going to make them much better. Um, so uh, I, we do, we all wish you the best. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Hill. Yeah, just to clarify. So uh, we saw photographs that more work has been done on the tower, but a stop work order has been in place. So they're. Oh, violating. wait, wait, wait. I thought you wanted to say something nice. So, <laughs> Planner Bobbitt, we can talk about work anytime. This this woman has given eight years, almost nine years of the hard work here, and I was hoping maybe I wouldn't have to be the only one to say that she's a terrific human being. So, uh, yeah, no, I'm sorry. I thought I thought you were speaking for all of us in the interest of uh, collegiality and so forth. Yeah, thank you, Jessica. You've done a great job. Um, I, I, I'm sorry. I thought I thought that was a. We're moving on now. <laughs> I'm not. I'm just. Okay. just I, I want to also thank Jessica for, for her work, and, and um, you might want to think about it. You know, years and years ago, I thought about moving to Rancho Palos Verdes, and and it was the commute from almost anywhere that killed me. So, keep in mind, don't 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 cut all your bridges you might, uh, at once. You know, depending on where you're going to be living. Of course. <laughs> okay, are we good, Jessica? Thank you very thank much. Thank you, Jessica. Well, I haven't thanked you yet. Uh, wow. just, uh, I, I have other things to say, but I want to really thank you for trying real hard and, and learning, which is the most important thing. Uh, you're not cutting all your ties with Malibu. You get Trevor in Rancho Palos Verdes. <laughs> so you'll have one, one familiar face. So, uh, bon voyage. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. Is Craig done? Okay. Uh, Wait, I have other comments. Of course you do. Go ahead. Well, I have the right to. <laughs> okay. Uh, first, uh, this is for Steve McClary and Richard, I guess. We have a meeting at the end of the month, which is a huge meeting. Okay. It's the motel. Okay. We've already got probably a foot and a half of paper on it. We also have a Brown Act meeting, and we also have the, quote, save the way the world works Don Schmidt's meeting at the same time. And I'm wondering if maybe you might give us the afternoon off before all of that and, and move the Brown Act meeting or move our meeting. Uh, but when you pack a day with more than eight or 10 hours of being on Zoom, it gets tiring. Um, yeah, the other thing on the, uh, and I, Maybe you can give me a reply on that. Um, we all this tower is something that won't go away, okay? And uh, so we need to be kept up on it because apparently there has been some building. So if it, I know we tend to favor whatever school comes along with whatever they want to do, but um. People are upset, and and I really hope we have not let them continue construction, and I hope it doesn't stop opening our city hall, our uh, police station, because I assume the, the helicopter has something to do with that. So that's my comments. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, I guess everybody's had their say. Um, well, at, the, at this point on the consent calendar, uh, first is is the 3A. So I will uh, close my camera and shut the sound off and my cool. microphone here and I'll get out of Chair the way. Smith. Chair Smith? Yes, sir. If I may. So the consent calendar, the only time that you need to do that is if this item is pulled. If not, if no one pulls it and we're going to approve, let me take a look here. We have one, two three, four, five items on the consent calendar, we can just note that you're abstaining from A1 due to a conflict. So I think the way to do it is to see what items are pulled from the consent calendar. If that is one of them, it's its own item, then of course you're right, you have to recuse yourself. But if it's not pulled and it's one of many that we approve, we will just note in the minutes and in the record that you abstain from that due to your proximity, and then you can vote on the rest of the consent calendar. Okay. Yeah, I would like to pull item 3A2 and 3B1. Okay. 
And I would like to move the balance of the consent calendar. Unless anybody else has something to pull. I would second that. Do I say 3B2 or 3B1? 3B2. Uh, it'd be three. I, I heard 3B1. Yeah. Sorry. 3A2 three, three and 3B1. Correct. Yeah, that was it. Yeah. And we did also have a member of the public who wished to pull 3A2. Okay, so I have a motion on the floor. Greg second. second. I second it, yeah. Um, Vice Chair Mazza? Yes. Commissioner Hill? Yes. Commissioner Jennings? Yes. Commissioner Peake? Sorry, Commissioner Peake, we do need the, the audio. Yep. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Chair Smith? Yes. Motion carries. And then, Ms. Evans, just note for the record that, that Chair Smith would uh, abstain from 3A1. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to go to, let me get my glasses on here. Sorry about that. We're going to, uh, to uh, 3A2. Correct. A very quick correction I'd like to make. Uh, I think it's normal for us to put the vote when something's approved in the in the resolution. Um, so I'd like to put the um, motion under um, the vote under section one. Um, N. Let's put the vote three two. Uh, vote. I, I would second that if if need be. As a matter of process, do we need not need to open the public hearing first? Correct. We do. I I don't know if there was going to be a staff report or anything like that. But yeah, before we start deliberating, we do need to open the public comment. Can I uh, call on Rebecca real quick? Her hand is up, uh, Rebecca. Uh, just as a point of clarification, Patrick, the direction from the commission on the evening that we heard that project was for staff to bring back a resolution approving the project. So I don't believe we have a formal vote on the resolution itself yet. That, that is correct. This will be the, 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 the ultimate decision. I guess I'm, I will defer to the, to the wisdom of, of yourself or Director Malika on how we've treated these instances in the past and that when we do have this direction from the planning commission, do we typically memorialize the specific vote count? In this is, instance, I believe Vice Chair Mazza said it was. We opened the hearing for the vote. Uh, we had a, we had a vote to, we had a vote to refer this for resolution purposes. That if there was no vote recorded on the original direction, then you're reopening the hearing. I believe we took a vote last time to have the resolution presented as to us. If we didn't re memorialize that, then we were reopening the hearing for discussion. I apologize if I misspoke. I, I, I meant public comment. We do need to take public comment on the item because we pulled it from the consent calendar. Okay. Commissioner um, Jennings. Your hand is up. Whose hand is up? Yours is. Ah, thank you. For a minute, everybody's screen was frozen. I was wondering whether it was me or it was in the matrix somewhere. Um, yeah, it, it it's this comes. Uh, uh, this is a situation we've dealt with before because um, the issue before us now in three A two is whether the resolution that's been brought back accurately reflects what the commission did at the last hearing. And so technically, you know, assuming there aren't any objections to the resolution, everybody could say, okay, fine, and vote, you know, all in favor of it. And then later on, you know, three years down the road, uh, somebody raises a question, so well, how come you voted for that project? Well, we didn't, we're just voting for the resolution. So it, I, it, the bottom line is it's appropriate to include the vote in this resolution so that the members who opposed it or who who, who objected to it 
and then point to it and say, no, no, this was the vote. Uh, translate, do we do we put the vote on the uh, April 17th meeting to direct or do we put it on the tonight's meeting to approve? Sounds like the resolution needs to be revised to include that tally. And then we can vote or, on the you No, know, I don't care one way or the other. I just want yeah. my vote recorded. Um, if if you think just changing number N, that's my motion. We uh, change number. Where, where is N, John? I'm sorry, I'm trying to. Think. The N is uh, just the last, the meeting for May 1st. It's on page two of 22 of the uh, resolution under recitals. Page two of 22. Yeah, I think that would be the appropriate place to put it. Uh, just just a sentence that says that um, on a vote of three to two, the commission uh, directed staff to bring back a motion um, approving the project. Well, that would be under M, I would assume. However, we want to label it. It doesn't matter. Well, M is or the prior meeting. N is tonight. Oh, um, okay, fine. Yeah, fine. Okay, so I make a motion to put the vote. Okay. Hang on, Vice Chair, I apologize for, for interrupting. Can we, did I miss it? Can we please open this up to public comment before we start deliberating and making motion? Okay, very well. Uh, Rebecca, who do we have? Um, for the applicant team, we have Don Schmitz, and we also have um, Elizabeth Lynch, who is in opposition to the project. Um, let me see, I believe Don... Don Schmitz, if you could unmute his microphone, please. Audio check. Can you hear me, gentlemen? It's been a we can. stability problem, or is it just me? Is, it's, I'm it's, getting a sign that says my. You just you just destabilized. You're in the matrix right yeah, now. We think it's we think it's just you. Uh, there you go. You're you're back in motion. Yeah, you're back. We think it's just you. Hey, Don, if you'd like to begin. Certainly. Um, I'll keep it uh, short. Uh, basically, uh, I understand uh, Commissioner Maz's uh, uh, modification to show the vote uh, uh, of three to two. And uh, I agree with both him and Commissioner Jennings. It's entirely appropriate to include that in the resolution. I just want to uh, uh, reaffirm that this resolution that is before you tonight does accurately reflect the actions of the commission. I also wish to reemphasize that the conditions the commission wanted to see added uh, are in this resolution, uh, specifically uh, consistency with the dark sky ordinance and the modification uh, on the archeological monitoring, that there will be archeological monitoring, not limited to just three feet in depth, but to the bottom of all excavations. Um, the other things which are already vetted by this commission, I will not belabor, such as the monarch habitat, the landscaping, the water quality and everything else. Uh, clearly uh, what is before you is in fact consistent with your deliberations and your actions. Uh, I would urge that uh, there not be uh, an effort to reopen this matter, uh, as has been correctly stated by you, commissioners. This is simply a hearing on whether or not this accurately reflects the actions which you took. So with that, I'll wrap it up. Thank you for your time, and I'm available for any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Schmitz. <clears throat> And our next speaker is Elizabeth Lynch. Uh, she's in the meeting under Liz Lynch. Hello. Yes. Um, I'm on. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I would like the commissioners to take into consideration the fact that uh, the residence at three one eight four is. Uh, basically a 3,189 square foot residence on a 60, a 6,864 foot lot. I would like you to compare it 
to the only other project that's been under these same restrictions that's been developed at 31894, which is a 1,093 square foot house on a 3,385 square foot lot. It should be noted that the 31864 occupies 50% of the parcel and uh, basically the, uh, the residents at 31894 is roughly 30% of the project, i.e. this is an overdeveloped project. And information regarding the square footage, et cetera, was gotten from uh, Redfin as well as documents because the house has been for sale. There's been a sign out in front that the house has been sale, for sale. It has been on and off the market and the numbers have been installed all over the place. This indicates evidence that it's a spec house and not a dream house for the applicant. Uh, and I also would like to have the, make note to the commission that I just received a parcel from the Coastal Commission, which is huge. I just received it, it's a massive document. And I would ask the Planning Commission to commit, continue this hearing so that they can review this project if there is some evidence out of the Coastal Commission. And I would like you to reconsider the appellant's alternative to come back with a less intrusive uh, building plan, which is more in keeping with the LCP and the, all the, the codes that cover this. Uh, thank you, and I'm sure if you cared a question. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. And if there are any other members of the public present who wish to speak on this item and have not signed up to do so, please click the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. And seeing none. Okay, back back to us. Um, I'm sure that we this part should be a short deal, but go ahead, Commissioner Hill. Yeah, question for Attorney Donegan. Um, my understanding, and you, you can you can correct this or check it, uh, is that we don't open a hearing at this stage. Reopen the hearing uh, for further deliberations unless there is new evidence. Uh, in the record, being entered in the record, and I'm not sure what we just heard, um, whether what that was exactly, whether that qualifies as new evidence, and um, whether we perhaps need a clarification on what that was. Um, I think we heard two things. One, uh, a new interpretation of how this parcel compares to uh, the other developed parcel further to the north, and also, I don't know what that reference to Coastal Commission documents was, whether that uh, may or may not be new evidence. Uh, but if it might be, then perhaps we should know more about it. Or what? what is the standard here about what, what it would take to uh, relook at this? So as an initial matter tonight, we would not be able to do any of that. This wasn't notice for a public hearing. We didn't you know, notify right. everyone. I know we do have the app team here so that's kind of step one if there was as you say new evidence something that came about with all of a sudden that the planning commission no longer felt that the resolution before you tonight was you know was appropriate that would be direction to staff tonight at which point staff would then look at its calendar get with the applicant and basically re-notice the hearing now i will advise you that's you know should really only be done in the most, I don't want to say extreme, but unique, unique circumstances. People show up, you all deliberate, you all make votes. The last thing we want is the secondary action of people always being nervous that, hey, well, they may kind of reverse course when we when we bring that that resolution back. Yeah. So, okay. So I think you, you confirmed my take on it. I, I did not understand at all what the reference to Coastal Commission documents was about. Did anybody get that more clearly? A big package. Uh, quite frankly, that will be heard by city council and the coastal commission, then us again, and then the city council and then the coastal commission. So it'll have plenty of time to be heard. Yeah. And in other words, tonight, not enough uh, specificity to c consider it as new evidence. 
Okay, so can um, chair or actually question for the city attorney. How do we need to make a motion for this if we're going to add the language in there that edits uh, part M referencing the tally of the vote on the project? It would, it would just be a motion to approve this resolution with that modification. Okay, I would like we, to make that motion. Well, I'm going to add, uh, I'm going to add, I'm going to second that with a, uh, a question and an amendment if Skyler will go along with it. I would assume that Jeff agreed with me it belongs in M. That's the vote we made to disapprove or approve the project and send it to resolution. And then I would assume that since Chair Smith is going to sign this, after we make this resolution, that it should also be the vote tonight, it should be in N. That's fine. I don't have any objection to that. That makes complete sense. And we should probably do that moving forward on anything, just so that that's kind of the process moving forward. Are we all in agreement on that? Yep. Yes. Yes. So I'll call the question. So okay. I made the motion. I'm okay with the amendments for whatever that's worth. Thanks. Um, Okay, so Skyler's made a motion. We're ready for a vote here. I believe we're all in. Uh, Rebecca? We've lost her. Apologies, I was muted. Um, who was the second for that motion? Uh, John was. Oh, thank you. Commissioner Peak. Yes. Vice Chair Mazza? Yes. Commissioner Hill? Yes. Commissioner Jennings? Yes. Chair Smith? Yes. Motion carries. Can, before we go on, can, can I get a phone number to call in on? Because I'm, 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 I've got picture, and, but the sound's breaking up a little bit. So if I could get a phone number that I could actually listen to it on, that would help me. Alex, are you able to send that to him by email? Um, Jeff, you actually just have to do it yourself. Um, in your mute and unmute button in the upper right corner of it, you'll see a little up carrot, and then yep. you'll see switch to phone audio. It'll give you all the phone numbers and tell you how to connect your user and all that. Thank you. No problem. Thank you very much, Alex. Okay. Uh, 3B2, and then we go over to 3B. 3A1, 3A2. 3B1, 3B2. Three B one chair Smith. We just did three A two one. Yes, we yes. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, uh, I don't need a staff report. Um, unfortunately, we cannot. We don't have the authority to give this extension, and that is because, and this has been determined by the Coastal Commission in a case we had on Big Rock. Uh, about a year and a half ago, it went all the way up to the Coastal Commission. The receive date is stamped on the on the letter. The letter was dated September 6, 2022. The receive date was 3-8-2023. And there's two questions here. One, uh, at the top of that receive date, it says, due to technical difficulties, staff was unable to Download this document on 3-2-23. Well, the first question is of Richard. Did staff really go six days without being able to download documents? That seems pretty impossible to me. I need to look at my calendar, but uh, perhaps I think I saw Tyler on the meeting. Yeah, can you guys hear me? So I'm having some technical Tyler, difficulties. Yeah. Isn't this due to the was it Friday? The internet died at City Hall for the for pretty much everything, electronic submittals. Um and if because if, if you recall, this affected your Zumira's project because Don oh. Schmitz, uh provided us with apparently a revised plan that we never saw. Yes, yes, that is correct. Uh, and, and then to couple that, uh, it was a weekend 
uh, three, two, uh, looks like a Thursday. Uh, and so, you know, some of those days were weekend days. So the answer to your question is yes, Commissioner Maza. We have a number of internet issues. Uh, one being that our submittal portal does not provide a confirmation uh, email notification or anything like that. You, you, you blindly submit. It's actually something I was looking into today for another matter. Um, our software, and we are looking at other software, but we have not purchased it, uh, which would provide some sort of confirmation. But then there was also the issue where our internet servers, uh, apparently it all stemmed from, a, I want to say, there was an update put into our um, uh, mailing, la our label machine up at the, the receptionist desk. And apparently... Uh, that update affected our entire server and our entire network. And so folks could not work remotely. Uh, you couldn't log into the city and as well as uh, emails, we weren't getting them. So this happened in that time frame. Pat, if I could let you speak to our responsibilities for deadlines when that happens. Uh, sure. And so, you know, Vice Chair Maza, I'm not familiar with the case or, or authority that you are citing that our stamp is the dispositive evidence of it. What I see in the in the record, including the testimony from Director Malika, as well as in the staff report that this was received on March 2nd, 2023, um, is an, obviously entirely appropriate for you all to inquire to that and say, hey, it says 3-8, what happened here? And so the technical difficulties or potential network issues on the city side in no way should, you know, uh, prejudice or impact any, you know, applicant or in this instance, uh, a CDP owner who wants to, who set, who submits it for an extension. Okay. The reason I brought those stamps up is I am now assured that the city received it on three, two. Okay. And this project expired expired at midnight of at the beginning of 3-2. So as in the exact case we had, I I can't, I, Joe, if Joe Drummond's still here, it went to the city council and it went to coastal commission that you may not, you may not under any circumstances under the LIP and the LCP and the local coastal plan extend an expired permit. This permit was expired on 3-2. And we have, we have a direct coastal commission determination of that, and the project <clears throat> had to be resubmitted. And that's in the record. Uh, Joe Drum is here. She could probably tell us exactly the address, but it was, a, it was uh, appealed by a hack Wong who was a neighbor, and he took it all the way to the Coastal Commission and won. So unfortunately, uh, the applicant missed the deadline. And there is no leeway. You can't say, oh, gee, he forgot. You can't say, oh, gee, I, I had an electronic problem. No, you certified you got it on 3-8, and on 3-8 it was expired. And Richard, I'm sure you'll remember that case. Well, I, I do remember that case. And what I recall from it was that the planning director accepted an extension beyond the deadline. The day uh, after. Pat, Pat, in this case here, we have a an issue at City Hall, a very real issue, one this commission recalls. Uh, the Zumira's project was a perfect example uh, to point to because the commission was shocked by the plans that I want to say the uh, uh, Schmitz's team uh, submitted to us on a Friday and we were unaware of it. Uh, but do you have any, I, I turn to you because I look at this one as I think the information before the commission is that the applicant submitted to us we could not download it. 
I, I, Richard, this was my point that I just made. You certified just now that it was three to three eight. Okay. You certified. I did not say that, Commissioner. Yes, you did, and it's stamped on the report. Received. I'm quoting them. Received. Was unable to download the documents on. Was unable to download the documents on three two. Received. Stamped and read. Three eight. Planning department. That's. We just went through that. That's clear as a bell. It's also clear as a bell. You may not approve an expired, you can, may not extend an expired permit under any circumstance. And so, Chair Smith, and, and so we, we understand the, the issue here. I, I, I would advise to open it up to public comment first, and then we can, we can come back to, the, to this discussion. Okay, very good. Rebecca, do we have anybody that wants to speak on this? Um, we don't have anyone signed up in advance of the meeting. If there, if the applicant and or owner are present in the meeting, can you please identify by clicking the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen? Or if there are any other members of the public who would like to provide comment, please do so now. Uh, so I see Joe Drummond. Oh, hi, I was just going to give the address for that, um, for the, the appeal to the Coastal Commission it was 20272 Inland Lane, that's all. Thank you. Now, uh, I can make a motion to continue this while you do legal research, but if we approve this, it is, it is absolutely an invalid approval. And so you're sticking the the applicant was something that can be called back at any moment. It's just an extension. It's, it's not just, just an, an extension. extension. It has to do with following the law and the determination by the full Coastal Commission. It, and to say, gee, it's just an extension, I'm going to ignore the law means everything you can ignore. And that as Mr. McClary said, we were supposed to have be working within a framework here. And when you just say, let's ignore the law, so, hang on. working no outside one, the framework. No one's ignoring the law, but so, but so Vice Chair Maz, I, I do want to be sure that we all understand. So the stamp on the, the time extension request, where it says received 3-8-2023, I believe we just heard testimony from the director that that was due to computer issues or network issues on the city's behalf. Hang on, hang on, please, 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 Vice Chair Maza, let me finish. The staff report posits, and I quote, on March 2nd, 2023, the applicant submitted an extension request to ensure a valid CDB permit remains in place. Now, now, once again, if you all are not convinced by that, and you have the requisite number of votes, that is entirely fine. However, that is the evidence in the record from where I sit right now, the stamp due to downloading errors or network errors is not dispositive. No one's gonna look at that and say, well, just because someone, it could have been for a whole host of issues. Maybe someone took a day off, they were gone for a week, network issues. There's a million different reasons. I, I just you, wanna point out that you just made my point. I am not saying that they did not receive it on three, two, it says, you just testified yourself, Richard testified, and this document says it was received on 3-2. It was expired on 3-2. The day you, Patrick Donegan, said it was received, it was received. It was received, expired. Okay? That's why I asked you that first. You, you Richard, and you and Richard have certified Right now, the, the, the writing at the top said it was received on 3-2. And you testified, yes, it was received on 3-2. On 3-2, it was expired. If you had received it on 3-1, no problem. Okay? So you can't say, I'm gonna, I don't believe that, because you just said you do believe that. But it, it, it's a, 
Go ahead. It has nothing to do with electronics. It has to do with can, when you received it. Uh, Chair, can I ask a question of our city attorney? You can. Okay. So is this project, when in the verbiage of saying it was set to, to expire on 3-2, are we saying on 3-2 at, you know, 12-01 a.m. that that project is expired, yes or no? Or are we saying on 3-2 at 11-59 p.m. the project is expired, yes or no? I just want the clarification on that because that's sort of the deciding factor in this issue. Yeah. And, and, and so I will I will also bring in Director Malika here. It is my understanding that it is that is it is the same day, just you add the years. But but Director Malika, is that how we've treated it in the past? That is correct. It's the day from which the permit becomes effective. There's an appeal. We would uh, I guess the term would be tolling. If there were an appeal to it that held it up, uh, that would be added to it. Yes. So the, the, question, so has, the this, question has to do with what time of day. No, so, oh, yeah, so for clarification on that, wait, if this wait, project. Wait. Commissioner Peak. If if the project was originally approved on March 2nd, it would be effectively approved on March 2nd at noon in the day or at, you know, I, 1 a.m. or right, if, I, right, uh, at midnight. Right. Correct. I, I believe that we we don't look back to the exact specific of the time of day. Rather, we give the applicant that entire day. We don't say, hey, we have to go back and look at the, the meeting. And it was 737 p.m. That's when we voted on it. So in X amount of years from then, unless you get it in by 737, it is expired. We basically give them the entire day. That is not true. Hang on, Vice Chair. There's other people have their hand raised. Uh, Director Malika. Thank you, Chair. Uh, to be clear, what our attorney, uh, Mr. Donegan, is telling you is correct, unless we put a specific uh, time, uh, time frame, a window ending. So, for example, with appeals, we'll often say end of business day. Uh, but unless it is specified with something that specific, we do essentially the, the calendar day, the end of the day. That is not true. Okay, you know, I don't like to say that. Did you, did, did, but you have hang to. On, Vice Chair, Vice Chair, you, you've, you've had your say here. Commissioner no, I haven't. Yes, and you I'm have. Commissioner Jennings. I feel like it. Okay? You don't get yeah, to. The, the, uh, yes, I do. Okay, so, I, I, John, you have to ask permission before you speak. The, well, the did issue, you? Uh, did you? Is of, did you? I just did, and he called on me, yes. Uh, and so my point is that there is zero social utility to questioning whether or not this, how many angels can dance on the head of this pen, uh, denying the extension, send things back to uh, redo, which cost, which which has no effect other than to cost everybody a lot of money. So uh, my motion is to approve staff recommendation. I I would like to make a comment. I'm going to go to Commissioner Hill first. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. My hand has been up longer than anyone's. Uh, I would like to know, we have a, a received stamp 3-8. That's the, normally the dispositive indication. And we have a note saying that there were technical difficulties prior to that. Is there any independent affirmative evidence that they actually did submit it sooner than that? This is This is, this is not, in my mind, not closing the loop here to just say, well, we couldn't get anything over the internet, so we're going to assume they did send it. That I don't know. That do we, do we have other evidence that they actually tried to send it on time? They did send it. They did send it. How do we know? I can answer that question if I will be called up. Vice Chair Mazza. If someone okay. knows, please. I am it. not. You, everybody is misunderstanding this, and I want to be sure. I don't think we are. Yes, I'm saying forget 3-8, forget electronics. Is there dispositive evidence that we received it on 3-2? Yes, the planning director and the assistant city attorneys just certified that, okay? Now, that's no question about 3-8. No question the computers went down. I asked that question to make sure I was assured by staff that it was 3-2. Now. The reason why I would like to make a resolution to continue 
until our attorney researches this is there is a case on point with the Coastal Commission that overturned a project that had to be resubmitted because it, it the Coastal Commission determined that the expiration date is the expiration date. It is not valid on the expiration date. It has expired. They determined that directly on point from Malibu on whatever day on whatever project that Joe Drummond gave the address of. They had a vote. They directed us to reverse it, and the project was denied. Okay, this is on. This is Patrick can look it up and read it. But if you say, "Gee, I think." What happens here is this client, this person will now never know when they can start their project because they don't know if it's legal or not. And we have a direct case on point from the full Coastal Commission, not their staff, after an appeal to the city council and appeal to the Coastal Commission by a citizen. Okay. That is written record. Now, it's not for Richard or Skyler or anybody else to say, gee, that wasn't the way it was, because it is written record. The, case, the project was stopped. The appeal was, the appeal was upheld. The project had expired. And we were directed, you may not uh, advance a expired project in any circumstances. Now, I think the the uh, applicant deserves a real uh, legal opinion, not an off-the-cuff one, because this is a big deal. I don't think there's any off-the-cuff anything here. We have an attorney on staff, but doing that. Um, my thought here is, um, you know, your driver's license expires on your birthday. So if these folks got in there on the second, raced across town, however they got it turned in on the second, it's still good on the second. No, it isn't. Like, Hang on, I'm speaking. So I, I just don't know why this has to be so hard on this because the city had some problems. It's happened before. We've had meetings canceled. We've had city council meetings canceled because we haven't had internet and other things that happened down there. So um Yes, this is just a simple extension, and uh, I don't see a, a, a bad situation here except for trying to stop it from having the extension. So I, uh, that's where I am. Commissioner Peak. I just, you know, like in reading the fact that the decision was made on March 2nd, right, at some point likely in the evening by the Planning Commission to grant that extension, if we're going to say that it's a one year extension, a one year extension would bring you back to that same day in the evening. So just to be fair with that, if we need to change a resolution in the future to have a time stamp on it for whatever reason we do, or if we need to change the resolution to say, if in the future we're approving a one year extension from March 2nd and it will expire on March 3rd, then we ought to be clear in that. But I'm in agreement that I, the way that I read it, it's completely allowable within the time stamp, within the time frame of a year, based on the fact that that decision was made on March second, twenty twenty, in yeah. the evening. I just don't get where we're. Am I? If I'm missing something there, that's fine. I mean, please let me know. I just don't see that. You're not, Director Malika. John, maybe John could make a motion rather than continuing. Well, I, I, I just I want to explain to Skyler. The Commissioner Jennings. Very same thing about a date. Is a year 30, 366 days or 365 days? Is has been decided by the body who wrote the law and who enforces it on to a, on an appeal directly to point one day. Okay. They said it expires when it expires. Okay. They did. Not uh, us. No, no, John. You're missing the if 365 days is 365 days. This then, is 366. If you want to know the difference, okay. Well, because we have a leap year. No, because you you don't go from 
May 1st to May 1st and have 365 days if you count the second May 1st. You have 366. But you voted also, on it on the evening of May 2nd. No, no. If you had passed a resolution saying I'll give them a month, a year and a month, fine. It's, we passed a resolution. They gave I'm done them, splitting hairs over this. Yeah, no, it's I, not splitting hairs, Skyler. It went to appeal. It, Somebody paid money to go to appeal and they won. Okay, and it was Vice Chair. Can I get a second on my motion? Yes. Okay, you got an appeal coming. Why are you going to waste this guy's money? But why do you say that all the time? You know, that's right. that, to me. For four <laughs> meetings, we've had four appeals. That's why. Four. You say that all the time. Oh, all well, go the time. count them. You want me to list them off? Somebody, somebody's going to come for you for that. Gentlemen, let's just. I'm just More saying, when you violate the law, there are consequences. When our attorney... John, nobody... Advice, we all understand your argument. The record, without checking the record, he is not doing us a service. It, I all it's understand a, your argument. Correct. And so it, okay, so... And, and so Chair, a if I may... Hey, Chair, I, I, I do have to, have to respond to that. Um, everyone knows exactly what, what the issue is here. Is the May, whatever we have the date... The, the permit condition states three years after issuance. It has been the city's practice. What I, from my understand, is that if it gets approved on May 2nd, you get three years from May 2nd. The exact record that Vice Chair Mazza is referencing, I, I unfortunately am unable to find right now. However, a different Coastal Commission report that I'm staring at right now indicates that the permit expiration was on November, basically did what we did. If it's November 10th, 2019 you get till november 10th 2020 so that is the issue before everyone i'm not purposely violating the law rather i'm maintaining a past city practice one that the applicant i believe was likely apprised of before saying when is my due date and so there's a whole host of issues that, that, that go into that but when people say that i am purposely violating the law i apologize i have to say that i you know i have to explain myself thank you chair okay we have a motion from commissioner jennings can we get a second please I'll second. What is the motion? I'm sorry. Mr. Right to grant the one year extension. Yes. Yeah. This is to grant the one year extension. Uh, may we have a roll call, please, Rebecca? Commissioner Jennings? Yes. Commissioner Peak? Yes. Commissioner Hill? I'm sorry, John is trying to speak. Has he been uh, muted or what's going on there? I don't know what he's doing. I don't know. He appears to have muted his microphone. Uh, I'm voting no. Vice Chair Mazza. It's an illegal vote. Um, so Vice Chair. That's not an answer. I'm sorry, Vice Chair Mazza. Um, would you like to vote yes, no, or abstain? I'll vote illegal. Uh, uh, Ms. Evans, that, that, that refused to answer, mark him down as an uh, abstention. Thank okay, you. Patrick, what is, uh, tell me, you say. Hey, um, we're, in, we're in a vote, Vice Chair, and I vote yes. Thank you, Chair Smith. Motion carries. Okay. Okay, now I have a, a comment. We're done. We're done. We're going okay. to the next project. The pawn, if I'm chairman or anybody else is chairman, they can stop debate without Robert's Rules of Order. Is that correct, Patrick? No, so Robert's Rules, no, I, who who stopped debate? Chair Smith did. We just took a vote, Mr. Donegan. Yeah, I mean, he he, he called for a, a vote. Typically, it's been the uh, practice of this body that we do not make formal motions to, to end debate. Rather, that is, that is counter what, to what we've been taught by the senior attorney of this city. In, in, in terms of it's been typical that this body has made a motion to end debate. Typically, it's if no one says anything, then it, it, it kind of go it kind of proceeds. There was no motion to end debate. That's my point. We right. we, we, correct. Th th that has been the typical practice, not only of this body, but basically every every other body that after a motion and second and debate has kind of you know processed there's not really ever been a time or at least i can recall that this body has someone's made a motion that we end debate we then second that and vote on that and then we vote on the actual motion rather 
once everyone has had their say, everyone has made their comments, the chair in his chair prerogative asked Ms. Evans to, to call the vote. Okay, so that's that means that we no longer follow Robert's Rules of Order. That's not what I said. That's it. Well, that's what the all. fact is, and you can ask. There we go. Thank you. Um, all right, I think we, we've got another, with this one, uh, 3B2 goes to May 15th. We have, um, this is a uh, uh, de minimis waiver. This is a receive and file on 3B3. I don't believe we have to talk about that. We're on the we're on. Yep, we're on to four B. On to four B. Zoning text amendment number twenty one dash zero zero five dash an amendment dash an amendment to Title seventeen uh, zoning of the Malibu Municipal Code to update regulations related to temporary use permits. Continued from March twentieth, twenty twenty three. And we have Mr. Donegan. Do we, who's going to get it? It's, I believe yes. it's contract planner Smith, if memory serves. Yep. Yes, that's there he is. All right. There he is. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll be giving the presentation on this. Sorry. And, uh, okay. So, uh, Turning back to this item, this is the second meeting on the zoning text amendment, looking at your temporary use permit chapter. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, by way of quick background, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but uh, this does look at amending chapter 1768. This is the section of code that regulates temporary uses and events on non-residential property. We looked at this March 20th of this year, uh, received a good amount of feedback from the council. Thank you. For that feedback, went back and made several updates to the ordinance that's in your packet. And so what the purpose of tonight's meeting is to request a formal recommendation to the City Council. Next slide. I'll walk through the updates made just in summary. Uh, here's the sections for this code section. Uh, we did update uh, most of the sections as reflected here. Uh, one section has been deleted. That's the application filing section, and I'll, I'll note why that happened. We did add a new section, which is uh, which is now section 30, which is uh, essentially the de minimis section that was referenced last meeting. Um, there is also a uh, a note later in the presentation regarding the director's uh, decision time frame in in section 050, which we'll look at too, and I'll be including that in the request for for recommendation. Next slide. You can advance the slide, please. Thank you. So the updated ordinance structure uh, reads as follows. Uh, section 20 is now the application submittal requirements. Uh, the prior section 20 has been deleted, adding a new section 30, which is essentially the TUP exempt section. Next slide. I'll just go through these uh, briefly, just to touch on this. There's two there's two attachments in your staff report. Uh, attachment B is what you see here on the right. This this reflects all the uh, the blue text is everything that was added in response to the planning commission's feedback. Attachment C is the master uh, strikeout underlined version of the entire ordinance. And so I think just for the sake of clarity, I just wanted to walk through the changes made with respect to the next few slides here and just uh, give a quick overview as to what was discussed and why. And this will essentially be the, the end of my presentation here. So in the first section under purpose, uh, we added language just to clarify that the chapter extends to all non-residential zones, so including commercial, institutional, and so forth. And that's the first two little edits here. And then the last one is to uh, add protective language to emphasize the importance of considering surrounding neighborhoods associated with the location of these uses. And we had a, a good amount of discussion on that as well. Next slide. This is the section that was deleted. Uh, it was deleted due to, due to redundancy. Uh, we now have uh, the current section which lays out, which, is, which will be 020, which lays out the specific TUP application requirements in lieu of having to reference back to this code section. And so it was outdated and no longer applicable. Next slide. The uh, proposed new section, which is 20, it was previously 30, 
this lays out the application submittal requirements. And as we mentioned before, uh, this gives an applicant everything they need to know to submit a TUP application. Next slide. There was some discussion about uh, all agencies, and so we went through and made a clarification edit here just to indicate that um, that all agencies requirement will refer to a separate TUP checklist that's provided by the planning department. That's a checklist that's updated from time to time to keep it relevant. It doesn't require code amendments. And so that'll be reflected there. Uh, the next section at the bottom there under H gets into the public noticing. Uh, we had discussion that the planning director would be able to waive the noticing requirements for certain types of minor TUPs, such as events that would not include, say, food alcohol service, uh, amplified sound, so forth. And so we added that in and then also removed the section on the three sets of labels since that's outdated. Next session. And next slide, please. We had some feedback notes to council that we uh, reflected here. And so uh, number one, regarding the filing fee for a TUP, uh, these would carry forward to the city council, just reflecting the planning commission's feedback that council should update the TUP schedule with uh, the actual time spent on TUP processing and also look at adding a planning staff position to help facilitate the processing of these applications. Next slide. Section 30 is the new section that was added. Again, this is, uh, we talked about a de minimis section or a TUP exempt section. This list includes city owned parcels and parks, which, uh, which was relocated from a different chapter. And as well as other temporary uses generally discussed by the planning commission as being de minimis. And so what we did here is, is took the liberty to go through based on planning commission's discussion and create a list of items that are reflective of that feedback and then also reflective of some other codes that I had, I had looked at. And so with this uh, first section here, we have uh, section A, which gets into uh, discussion about what the section is and then also that the planning director would have the ability to evaluate uses and still require a TUP if there were special circumstances. Uh, subsection A1, this is the language that we went through at the last meeting. It's been now updated to city owned parcels and parks and includes the same language that we saw before, 100 attendees, no admission, and so forth. And then also adding the section in about compliance with any underlying use restriction on the property shall be maintained. And so that would get into deed restrictions, other use restrictions re reflected on a property, and so forth. And Trancus Canyon um, Park, Legacy Park, that type of thing. Next slide, please. Okay, subsection two gets into public events and or uh, private events not open to the general public. So this one has to get into the discussion we had about a situation where a site has an existing authorized permit, such as a conditional use permit. And so this just makes it clear that public events operating within that permit would not need a TUP. Uh, subsection three, this is pulled in from some other codes. Generally, there is a discussion about uh, youth oriented fundraising and commercial activities conducted on private property. So product sales, other uses of similar conduct. We're specifically not naming what these are and that's uh, on purpose, but the concepts there. Uh, sec subsection four, there was discussion. Uh, the term is busking. Um, it's someone playing say a guitar outside of a commercial shop. And so there was discussion about maybe we should have an allowance for very small limited activities like that. So this is it. It's entertainment performances conducted on private property, it gives the example or similar, so long as it's conducted ancillary to other primary uses, it's not the dominant use and also an admission fee is not charged. And then lastly, uh, five here gets into non-commercial speech activity protected by the constitution and so forth. Uh, there's an example of language here that comes from some other codes and we've added that in. Next, uh, next slide. <clears throat> and the last section is uh, subsection B, which this is a catch all, but the, the important part about this one is this is the city's enforcement mechanism to be used in the event there is a violation of city codes. And so Title Eight, Title Nine, those are our primary codes dealing with health and safety, noise, trash, public peace and welfare. This uh, gives that ability to circle back and, and ensure that uh, we have a, a catch-all provision for that. Uh, that's it for this section. We can move on to the slides. Uh, section 40 is uh, temporary use permits, temporary uses requiring permit. 
So just indicating here, this is where the prior uh, previously the language about the city on parcels and parks was found and when that's been moved out as we just covered. Uh, there's discussion here about uh, limiting events on a site with multiple parcels. There was uh, a concern shared that a situation where there's one commercial use that operates collectively that is made up of say four or five, six different parcels. Each parcel doesn't get the six 60 day limitation. And so we added in that language that was discussed. Also clarified that events uh, occurring on the city owned parcels and parks uh, are not subject to that six annual uh, event limitation, as well as the 60 cumulative day uh, limitation that was discussed. Now, there's also a sentence added in here uh, reading events may occur on consecutive or non consecutive days within the 14 day limitation. That was something we talked about. Uh, staff had added that request as well at the last meeting. Just to help clarify that an event doesn't have to operate within the 14 days every day consecutively, that it can break it up. Uh, next slide. Okay. Um, subsection three here, this is the one that has caused lots of confusion uh, over the years, and we had a discussion about this as well. Uh, there was a concern to, to figure this one out. And after reading this uh, several times, we just decided to just delete the second portion of this provision due to confusion with the way it was worded. So the takeaway is that events such as those listed here, weddings, fundraisers, retreats, fairs, festivals, concerts, those types of things could be requested under a minor TUP. That's what the section is about. If there is a site with an existing CUP that wants to do one of these uses, we have that previously de minimis section, which makes it clear they would not require a TUP. So, that's what this section's about. If there's an event that is larger in scale, it would trigger a major TUP under the, the other threshold uh, components that we have. So one way or another, these uses are dealt with within the code. Either they're exempt, they're minor, or they're major TUPs. Uh, the prior subsection four, this is the art, cultural, educational exhibits. Uh, this is really, I think, what triggered this whole discussion. Uh, there was a request and feedback from the commission to just delete this provision. It was deleted. Uh, the discussion was to avoid singling out certain types of events and to remain content neutral. So based on other provisions in the TUP chapter as proposed, these types of events may still be considered. Uh, they could be considered similar to the one above. They could be de minimis or exempt from a TUP. They may also be subject to a minor TUP or a major TUP. So just by deleting it doesn't mean they cannot happen. It just depends where they fall now into the new buckets. So I just wanted to make sure that that's clear. Also, the proposed TUP chapter still provides this catch-all provision under subsection B7 in this chapter that could also be used to require a TUP if applicable. So uh, one way or another, there's room now for the city to understand and try to, to figure out how these uses should, uh, should be processed appropriately. Next slide. Okay, so, so here there was uh, just some carryover language that we cleaned up. Uh, we just removed the 660 day limitation. This is with respect to the temporary relocation of a farmer's market. That's just to be consistent with the prior discussion. Also, uh, there was language in here that was proposed. It says, in addition to a TUP, a facilities use permit. Uh, that's, uh, that's been updated to just be more broad in, in to read all other approvals, such as a facilities use permit. And that's intentional just because uh, that may change from time to time, especially if there's administrative uh, the requirements that the city has for use of parks. And then uh, lastly here is just uh, changing the word similar to other uh, small discussion about that, just to help broaden that TUP requirement by the director. Next slide. Uh, two other provisions here were deleted in this section. Now, this has to check my notes. This has to get into the major TUP section where there used to be two existing uses that were carried over from the existing code. One about real estate sales office, rental offices, and another one about on-site, off-site construction yards. So these, these components were deleted based on commission feedback because uh, these are uses that are expected to be included in an otherwise uh, development approval request. So somebody has a project coming along, these, these items need to be included in that request. And if they're not, it would require an amendment to that permit. So let's just take them out of the code for this section. And then lastly, carrying forward that neighborhood language under uh, the new section five based on the purpose statement language that we added. Next slide. 
Uh, there were three feedback notes to council here. Uh, two straw polls were taken. The first had to do with um, swap meets, which is existing code language that says for no more than two consecutive days. Uh, there was a straw poll, poll vote taken to remove this. Uh, it was 3-2 in favor of keeping the provision. Um, Planning Commission also discussed that major TUPs would be advanced to the top of an agenda by an amended, uh, amended Planning Commission procedure if the ordinance is adopted. So I just want to reflect that here. We would circle back and make sure that's updated in your, in your manual. And then lastly, a uh, second straw poll vote about what the threshold should be to trigger a major TUP. Uh, through Zeresis, it came out at 1,000. It was discussed, should we reduce that to 750? A 3-2 straw poll vote, keeping it at 1,000. So that's that will be reflected at the city council. Next slide. Uh, under the findings, uh, just some minor uh, updates here, just again to reflect under finding six. This is a minor TUP finding made by the director. We just clarified the language city owned parcels and parks. And then also uh, removing the 60 day limitation as discussed earlier. So just cleaning up the findings to make sure it's consistent. And, and again, these are for the minor TUPs. Next slide. This is, and I apologize for the small font. This is the uh, requested edit to the resolution. This is not in the resolution that's attached to your packet, but staff would request that this be added. Uh, there is a section under uh, subsection 50, which gets into your permits and public notice requirements. You see all the, uh, the red lines that you see here in blue. Those are the revisions to the ordinance, not based on planning commission feedback. This is what came from uh, this racist process and presented at the last meeting as well. We just didn't have time to really walk through all these things. Uh, one of them in particular has to do when the planning director would issue a decision on a minor TUP. Um, we, uh, we inadvertently missed the requirement for the 24 day item here. So we are proposing that the director would make that decision within 14 days prior to the proposed event. So how this essentially reads is that uh, under A1 at the top, an applicant for a minor TUP would have to submit 45 days prior to the proposed use. And then notice goes out 21 days prior to the event. The director makes a decision 14 days prior to the event. And that plays into the appeal process and the appeal timing as well for a minor TUP, which is proposed at three days as opposed to a major TUP, which follows the city's standard practice and code requirement of 10 days. So anyway, that's the that's the item there. And I would just recommend that that get included if there's a motion on this item. Next slide. So uh, just the remaining sections of the ordinance, we just talked a little bit about 50 and 60. Again, uh, showed a few, few edits that were made there, minor in scope. Uh, we did run out of time at the last meeting. We didn't walk through these in, in detail. But there are several uh, red lines that were that came out of the Zeresis process. Again, we had three meetings with Zeresis to look through these. And so I just wanted to make sure that that's uh, Next slide. There's uh, two slides here based on Zeresis feedback we really didn't get into, but it's for the sake of the process, it's, it's important that we talk about it because they had recommended we bring this up at the Planning Commission. So currently, a temporary use permit has a 32-day public notice period. That's how the code reads today. Uh, there's a proposal to go to 21 days. Uh, there's uh, The discussion was that the TUP process was initially designed to protect the community and overall uh, quality of life for its residents. 32 days is the city's longest uh, public notice period for any action, including code amendments, local coastal program amendments, conditional use permits, uh, CDPs, all of it. So what we're doing here is we're proposing to move the TUP notice period to 21 days, which would be commensurate with your other major actions, such as a code amendment, CUP, a variance, and then just for, uh, with respect to just uh, disclosure, conditional use permit, uh, coastal development permits, and site plan reviews have a 10-day notice. So this would be the higher notice period. Next slide. And then we just walk through this uh, discussion here about the uh, other other ordinance updates about the time frame. So we're we're increasing uh, 45 days prior to an event that gives the city a little extra time to process these in a timely fashion, uh, adjusting that public notice period. We talked about that. There are uh, enforcement findings that have been built into the ordinance based on this racist discussion to make sure that the site has no active violations. 
and that the event is subject to all other city ordinances. Again, another catch-all provision. And then, as I mentioned, the appeal period, we're clarifying this. The appeal period in the existing code is, is not great. It's ambiguous and references uh, some wrong sections. So what we're cleaning it up to say is that the minor TUP appeal period would be three days and major TUP appeal would remain at 10 days, which is consistent with other planning commission decisions. Next slide. Um, so this is my last slide. Just um, recommend that we uh, that you adopt this updated resolution again, reflecting the uh, little edit that we talked about in the red text, and recommend the city council adopt this zoning text amendment. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, are we with us? Do we have any? Discussion, or are we going straight to a motion here? Oh, Vice Chair Mazza. Hang on, we need we oh, questions, questions public, for staff, public comment. Public and comment. Then, I knew that. I just didn't know if you remembered, and you did. Thank you. Yeah, and also, uh, we did not, we ended the last meeting at 17680060 and made a motion to continue that until this meeting. Uh, I think it's inappropriate for us not to review that section. Um, since we reviewed every other section, so okay, I'm let's gonna, let's yeah. go to let's go to public comment first, and then we can come back to that. So, Rebecca, who do we have, please? Uh, we have Joe Drummond for public comment. If there are other members of the public present in the meeting who wish to speak on the item, please click the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen while Joe is providing her comments. Hi there again. I have a question about the summer concert series on at the lumber yard. It, would that be treated differently than the summer concert series at vintage because the lumber yard is at on city property. So they do not no longer have to get a TUP. Is that what I'm understanding? I'm, I'm a bit confused on that. Um, I like from that presentation, it looked like you do not need a TUP if you're on city property. From what I got from that, and then I guess Vintage is on their own private property, so they would, I don't know, I, I know we discussed at previous hearings on this that there would be some kind of a series TUP so that they weren't limited to just two in two weeks or something like that, like they could have it every summer or um, something like that. So I'm just trying to make sure that we can have our summer concert series. Uh, that all of Malibu residents seem to love. So that's it. Thank you, Ms. Drummond. And I don't see any other hands for public comment. Um, okay, that's worth kind of answering now. Director Malik, is that something you can you could answer now? Mike on there. Sure, I'm actually looking through to see. I want to look for our exact language. Joseph, we say parks. Or did we strike that? Yeah, it's it's city owned parcels and parks was the language from the last meeting. All right. So then parcels would open up then any city property. So if this commission would like, uh, I'm trying to think oh. how we'd want to word it because I could see where the commission could want it for a parcel. And I think Joe, maybe help me with the nuance here if I miss yeah. it. A let, city. Let, I'll let you go. <laughs> oh, yeah, you know, it's okay. Let, let me just clarify. So, um, so remember, there's, there's protections built into that language. So it is now city owned parcels and parks. So yes, that includes city owned parcels. There's language built in that says so long as the number of anticipated daily attendees does not exceed 100. And an admission fee is not charged. So uh, and then compliance with any any underlying use restriction on the property shall be maintained. So every city owned parcel, if there's underlying uses, uh, underlying restrictions, those are maintained. If there's an event that's that's held on a city owned property, and we know that it'll be over 100 people, it steps up in the process. It's either a minor TUP or a major TUP, depending on the event duration. So that's automatic. Yeah, so we just have to figure out which bucket is it a is it exempt? Is it a minor? Is it a major? And that's all based on the proposed use. And so those those all get have to get checked 
as a request comes in. Um, okay, well, Director Malika, I'll go back to you real quick. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I, I think that, and I, I hate to put words in Joe's mouth, but I think the concern is that that is a city-owned parcel that is commercially leased, and there is a commercial operator on the site. So that may be something that this commission would want to perhaps think about uh, is if it's a city-owned parcel yet leased to a, uh, a, a Pat, would the term be a cons concessionaire? I'm sorry, I'm going to mess that up, but leased out to a commercial entity to operate. Term being, we say concession concessionaire. <laughs> right. If they, it, it, what I'm thinking of is kind of like how the the state puts the hands of the peer into a private entity. Right. Okay, um, Commissioner Hill. Uh, yeah, thank you. I, 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 I'm following what Richard says. That's that makes sense um, to put some kind of exclusion for commercial uses of or existing commercial uses of property. As a more broad question uh, and about process here, we have two threads. One being to pick up with the red line that we were doing last time. I think, as John mentioned, from uh, 1768-060. Also, I have a handful of questions that are more general in nature that arose out of our last thing, just to sort of, I guess they're mostly bases that either weren't covered or I'm not sure whether they were covered. And so I don't know if we'd want to talk about those before or after we go through a red line kind of line by line process. I'm not. Well, we can. Yeah, I'll take, I'll go in, in order right now, and then we, I guess we'll start that conversation if that's what everybody wants to do. Commissioner uh, Jennings. You're muted. There we go. Yeah, as far as the comments with respect to um, the lumberyard, uh, when we were giving our comments at the last meeting, I think everybody was thinking in terms of uh, parks and city hall and you know, places where the public is, is ordinarily uh, present and those being treated in one way. But I don't see any reason why city owned property that's leased uh, to a commercial development should be treated any differently than every other commercial development in town. It doesn't seem that there, there should be a, benefit or a detriment to to uh, a property just because it's it's uh, the, the, the the title holder is um, the city so I, I think that that change could be relatively easily made but um, I'll leave it to Mr. Smith to come up with the answer to that uh, and um, she mentioned another thing, which is kind of interesting, the idea of a summer concert series, which we have uh, talked about or touched on, but not really resolved in terms of a summer concert series. Um, so let's just take it as a hypothetical. It's a, a, a summer concert series every Friday evening uh, for during the months of June, July, and August. It seems to me that that would we have a hard time shoehorning that into the into the uh, requirements that we've got written. Is there is that something that maybe we would want to consider um, changing by by saying okay the number of the number of days even though it extends beyond the 60 day uh, window. Um, I, I think we need to approach it in a way to say is this is this the kind of thing we want to encourage, uh, and if so, figure out a way to encourage it rather than than uh, uh, simply sticking to, well, these numbers are, you know, are the ones we like. Yeah, very good. Vice Chair? Um, that is the, the uh, Lumberyard has a CUP. It makes it unique, and it has very serious restrictions on its use, especially in the summer. It's got valet requirements, et cetera. So it, it isn't really... When, if it was considered a normal business, it really couldn't do much. Uh, so I think we could amend that to say, uh, you know, city-owned properties excluding uh, properties leased to an outside, to a private 
party for an excess of one year. And that would just take take it out. If it ever goes vacant, then it's a city property again. Um, some version of that. So I agree with that. Uh, I've got some questions on what Joseph just said and uh, I'd like to ask, and then I think we should go to reviewing uh, Section 060, which is very important. It's what's required. Um, I'm sorry, before we move ahead, maybe we want a straw poll that just uh, memorializes. I think we have a majority, at least, that agrees we we need some commercial exclusion there, right? I like that idea. Yep. Okay. All right. Commissioner Jennings? Uh, I'm not sure what I'm being asked to agree to. I think I think you just proposed it pretty much, so. Yeah, okay. we're, we're, we're pretty much following what you said. Okay, okay then count me in. Uh, Commissioner Peek? I'm good with it. And of course, Commissioner Hill, you're good. And Vice Chair Mazza? Yep. Yeah. And I'm good. I think anything, anytime that we can all get together, which, which is really good that we should be able to. So, uh, brings people together somewhere in our city. Um, okay. So, uh, Mr. Smith, what do you need from us on that? Do you, you see where we are with that? Do you add that's language that you'll add or you'll strike out from somewhere else? Yeah, I will add a section after the city on parcels and parks. I'll do that language, excluding properties, um, Come up with the right language and make sure the city attorney sees it. Okay. I get the concept. Okay, great. Um, all right, I guess we'll come back to us. I'm going to go to Commissioner Hill first because he did have his hand up to to discuss one of these. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, and I expect we'll get to the, the line by line, but just with some more broad questions. Uh, and first, I'll put on my pedant hat, the height of pedantry here, and say, with the spelling, de minimis can have a U or an S at the end, but I think it's always a D-E, not a D-I at the beginning. Um, next, I think it might be help, <clears throat> it might help for the public to understand um, when a decision is the planning director's decision and when it's not. If there were some a general phrase up at the head of everything that basically said in some way, um, that characterized in some way, these are things that the planning director decides, these are things that go to the commission, and, and then as specified below in the text with all the, the detail that we have here already. Um, I don't know how you say that exactly, but if there's a simple way to characterize what's the distinction between who gets what, it looks like Skyler's proposing an well, answer there. I was just going to say that isn't that sort of something like in the forms or questionnaire that's like done where people are going to look at that and they're going to say, is your event over 100 people? Is your event, you know, those like Joseph's going to come up with that stuff and the staff's going to come up with that. Okay. And that's going to very clearly dictate which direction somebody's going right out the gate. Am I? Is yeah, that the, maybe that makes sense that the form itself will spell that out. Is that correct, Joseph? Or yeah, Richard. that is that is correct. There's always a checklist that adds way more detail than these ordinances that okay. picks those nuances. Yeah, but I think with that being said, and I think what Craig's point is, if we can make that as simple as concise and possible, that always I think bodes like makes our policy better to have the community understand that better. So, yeah. good point. Yeah, thank you. Um, Per the last presentation, the city attorney was to be reviewing whether we could limit permits to Malibu residents or to someone with a Malibu address, or uh, that, that was a homework question, and I don't know that we got an answer in the staff report. I, I forget even who raised it, but it was, you know, somebody saying we, we wanted, uh, I'm not necessarily even advocating it. It was just a question raised, and I, I think we never got an answer. Okay. Patrick, I can uh, let me just give the lead in on it on this one. Um, this this question, uh, Commissioner Hill, came from the Zeresis process where there was we were trying to figure out the arts, cultural, educational events, yeah. and there was talk about limiting that to certain, you know, residents or nonprofits. So that's where the question came from. Uh, we did bring it up. We've uh, talked to the city attorney's office about it. I know it's it's 
been under review, but uh, Patrick, I don't know if this is ready tonight or if it's something we can get into at the city council. It's kind of irrelevant right now because we struck that whole section. <laughs> <laughs> How do you want to handle handle that, Patrick? Yeah, so I mean, you know, obviously I, I I'm not very um, jumping at the at the chance to opine on something that is no longer relevant. I will say in our preliminary research and review, it is definitely not a practice that I have seen anywhere in terms of in this specific context. So, you know, I can provide, you know, if if the if if the city council or this or this commission were so inclined to 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 go that direction, you know, a further more substantive legal opinion would have to be drafted. However, limiting any kind of permit related to speech just on where you live is all is obviously very problematic. Yeah, and more broadly, I guess that there may be other kinds of permits where there might be uh, some virtue in, in residential favor, uh, favoring residents, but I, I don't know, maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe that's that's too much of a constitutional question. Well, okay. Craig, it is done. What? It is done legally. Uh, in Laguna Beach, they have the pageant of the masters and the festival of the masters. The city gets about $8 million a year out of it. The artists in the pageant of the masters in the festival must be Malibu uh, Laguna residents. They've been doing it for, I think this is their 97th year. Okay. So if we wanted to do it, absent a uh, super legal opinion, it is done, has been done in a coastal city. Uh, coastal city, it's 100% coastal. So, so maybe the notation, we don't have to just, I don't think we have to decide anything. This is for council, but to just say to council, there may be circumstances where, you know, to consider whether there's a, a, a residential preference. I mean, you, you have preferential parking in places too. That's a resident preferred kind of thing. So maybe the constitutional line is, is a little blurry there. Um, in the interest of just kind of keeping moving through this, there was a comment in the last meeting from the Film Society about does a membership constitute a fee for an event? Did we address that already or not? Do we need to? So, you know, this could be something that is applied. It could be clarified under a checklist. You know, I think, uh, Richard, we would need to figure out if, I mean, a membership is, it's a payment to attend an event. I think we just got to be careful with that. Uh, Patrick, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that either. Oh, that, 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 that's consistent with my understanding as well. Okay. okay. Um, Commissioner Jennings made a good point in the last meeting that when we're, that we've been looking at TUP in isolation from special event permits and that there was some talk of maybe some putting some thought into harmonizing the different categories um have, have did joseph or anybody else did you look at that sort of side by side again to see if there are any inconsistencies or ways to simplify things more yeah um i i was thinking through that uh, commissioner hill about these two sections of the code it's i think for this effort uh this you know this is my opinion this effort this is this seems to be the the best way to streamline it, unless we are looking at a larger uh, work bill to really try to clarify the two sections. It's how Malibu has set up regulating events. Not every city does it this way. Some cities have simplified it considerably, but the way our codes the codes are written for the city, this is how it it has literally separated residential from everything else. So I, I think at this time, it's that's beyond the scope of what we were directed to do. Yeah, Commissioner Jennings, is that kind of rubbing you a little bra still, or are you happy with that answer? Oh, you're muted. As a matter of policy, I think it would be better to do it, but I understand the practicalities of the situation. Yeah. So yeah. Nobody asked him to do that except us, and we don't we don't get to make those calls. Yeah, and John, are you on this point? Well, I I'm sorry. agree. This this whole this is one of the questions I was going to ask Joseph. This this whole section says this is just commercial, and you start going into neighborhoods and saying you can the the director can say okay you can have a thirty day permit to have a circus. Uh, 
they really cross lines. Okay, they really do. And uh, I heard that they were only going to approve those on Zoomers. What? <laughs> I said well, I heard they were only going to approve those on Zoomers. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And the the Christmas uh, parade can't come down Zoomers either. <laughs> um, Craig, are you done? No. Go ahead. Okay. Um, we also raised the question of I, the, the problem of identifying by parcel, where, for example, uh, some business has maybe five contiguous parcels. And so maybe there should be a definition that refers to contiguous parcels under common ownership as being mm -hmm. one. Something like that. I don't I, think we can address that. We have already done that in one case, and we could copy it directly, and that is uh, the retail ordinance covers all all properties that are owned. We have all that language, okay? So those properties owned by costs are all considered one shopping center. That's what I was thinking of. Yeah. So we could just copy that language. And isn't the staff that's in order to do that? Uh, yeah. It's there. I'm... It's in there. It's in there already. Right? Okay. Um... Well, is it, Joseph, is it the same as the retail ordinance? Are we going to have to parse between those two? No, no, we we have the language written in. It's This has to do with the 14-day, uh, six events, 60 cumulative day limitations. And we and we wrote in based on what the feedback was last meeting, um, specifically that, uh, uh, I just lost the, of course. Um, oh, yeah. Contiguous parcels when under common ownership sharing a related use. So okay. those would be treated as one, you know, parcel for the sake of these codes. But that's different than what the retail ordinance does. That's just why I bring it up. Yeah, I, I'm not prepared to talk about the retail okay. ordinance. All right. can I, Craig, can I ask a question on this? Uh, on that point, yeah. You, one of your points you made, you changed in here. You said uh, you can have 14 days, but you don't have to operate the event every day in those 14 days. And then you then you have a 60 day limit. Do you count the 14 days against the 60 day? It doesn't say, or do you count the the, the whatever days they do? And that makes a huge difference because then you could just go block out. A whole bunch of 14 days and pick one day each. Um, okay. Two days. Yeah. It doesn't seem to explain how that works. Well, and, and I apologize that that's confusing. The, the current code section lays out how that works. So it's, it's one event can be a, up to 14 days. The way the code section is written, it's consecutive days. And that's caused a lot of confusion. Can you have, a, have an event Monday, Wednesday, Friday? Technically, the answer is no, because the way the language reads. But the intent was, if it is it within the 14 days, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, whatever. Now, to your point, you get six events. So, yeah, six 14-day events a year. Also, the code has a 60 cumulative day maximum. So, six events at 14 days each is more than 60 days. So, you can't do six 14-day events. Anyway, that's that's how the current section has been written. That's what's been applied. That would continue to be applied moving into this ordinance. If you need to go beyond that, it kicks up to a major TV. Okay, so the 60 days is the number of days TUPs are issued. It's not the number of days they're actually used. It's the number of days for the event. Okay. Okay, I, I still that's have a few more, a few more here. Have we adequately considered the case where somebody outside the city, like say a party of 500 up at a house in Las Flores or Rambla or Payuma, wants to shuttle guests to and from a parking area in the city? Um, can we say do, is it, that outside of the city events uh, cannot park in the city? I know we don't have standalone parking lots, um, but you know if they want to be shuttling guests to 500 cars on the highway somewhere or how, how do we address these these big outside the city events that want to have a component in the city 
Well, uh, what I can what I can share, uh, Richard, if you've got some other thoughts on this, but what comes to mind for me is is an event doesn't mean that it has to be an event on the property in the sense of what we think of events. You know, using a parking lot for heightened activity, it's kind of easy to count the anticipated number of attendees um, and so forth. So, you know, there's there's catch all language throughout this ordinance that helps the director you know, move a requested use around, whether it's exempt or it takes a TUP of one sort. So I think that's the response back is it's it's all circumstantial. You know, what's the event? Where is it located? What are we talking about? And then we have to make a decision from there. So the feeling is that would be covered. John, is, do you have a comment on that one? Yeah, I do. Uh, I think the real question is, do we want to have events that are just parking lots? Yeah, because they have to apply for the TUP in Malibu, even though they're they're having the the uh, pleasure fair up at Milken's house. Okay, uh, I think that's a bad idea because we're not we're not set up, especially with our parking situation in Malibu, to provide parking for outside events and our findings for TUPs or whatever Richard has to find, a lot of it has to do with what, what the effect on the neighborhood is, what the effect on traffic is, et cetera, et cetera. And that's hard to do on a split TUP. Is it, is it, would Richard be able to find that they rent uh, the cement lot down the street from city hall and put 999 cars on it? Um, not a thousand. That's clear cut. Uh, that's something we should decide. Looks because like Sky Skylar has a comment. Something, yeah. I, and Skylar, uh, give, give me your comments. Well, I just, I don't really see that. The only scenario I can kind of see that happening is in the event where somebody goes to park a substantial amount of cars at like Zuma Beach, right? And there's a couple of events that have there that the county regulates, and then you're looking at all these film permits where oftentimes they're filming potentially way up a canyon, and then they're using that as like base camp, but we're not really regulating any of that stuff here. And I don't really see, like, I just, I don't see the scenario, and I'm not necessarily aware of the scenario happening where that's going to become an issue if that is something that is a concern. We ought to raise that and just tell the council, hey, we recommend that a Malibu should not be used as a parking lot for events that happen outside the city. And or that, or that a, a parking. Very simple. A, well, let me, let me we don't it. condone a, a, an event that is solely parking in the city, irrespective well, of whatever it's doing outside the city. There are a lot of events. Number one, Skylar, the, the county permits like uh, parking at Zuma Beach. Those are county issues. Okay. And the events that there are events that happen here and will happen with when they when they build a mount where you could have 25 basketball and NCAA basketball tournaments 25 games at 5000 people each uh, if if we're referencing that and we don't and events the event would happen outside of mount okay but but let's move this along here do we want to allow Parking in Malibu for offsite events or no? Yes or no? And my my opinion would be they should be under uh, if they're over if the outside event is over a thousand people, let's say, then no, they're not allowed without a major TUP because it's I, I was going to say walk you in and to... say it's too easy to walk in and say I got this big event. I don't tell you what it is. But I want to park in your your, your lot. Well, I, I was going to say I would make the threshold significantly larger than or lower than that. If, yeah, so would I. <laughs> I would so I would go more at like a hundred vehicles. I think that's that's a good point, and then they can have a hearing. Better and, policy, but I'd hearing. be curious to hear from Jeff, Dennis, and Craig. Over over a hundred vehicles automatically requires a T a major TUP. For events not held in the city. For yeah. Mr. Jennings? Yeah, I'm just trying to take it in terms of effects. We do uh, handle parking permits uh, on a fairly regular basis. We have our, uh, our the permits for 
uh, chili cook-off we talk about, you know, the, the, the property down there at the end of, of, of below the city hall. True. Uh, we've had uh, parking there. I don't see why it should be really any different. Um, you, you should be able to condition the parking uh, for all of the things that affect the city, the, you know, the way we have done in the past, where we say, all right, you can only have so many, you've got to have this much brush clearance, you've got to have fire engines there, or you've got to have fire extinguishers there, or you've got to have a guard on, on site all the time. We can so do you don't those see things. a categorical... And, and, I'm sorry, and do those things uh, regularly. So you don't now, see a categorical difference between whether the event, the main event is in the city or outside the city? I don't know. Well, remember, we're, we're, we are, Craig, we are exempting these. They're richer directed TUPs. They're not coming in like the, the farmer's market had to do and go through a full CDP and the whole thing. Okay. So, and, and if you talk about filming, we don't regulate film parking. It is regulated by the film office. So there's nothing other than just an event that we're talking about. And I would say we could say a parking TUP, I mean, a parking only event, which would be a parking lot for some event outside of the city, yeah. requires a, 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 a full on hearing because we don't know where they're gonna be or what they're gonna be uh, outside of the city. You could have, well, they used to have a pleasure fair up by Malibu Lake. But do do we care if it's out of the city? Yeah. I mean, maybe uh, Jeff makes a good point. Like we don't necessarily care what they're doing out of the city. We're more concerned about what's happening in our city. Exactly so maybe what we, I'm saying. If, we don't, so maybe the threshold is like, is it 250 parking spaces that then we would require? You know, like what's the number for that? Like, I don't even know any data on events that are happening where they're parking in the city that are that amount of people. Well, uh, we don't because it hasn't happened yet because they're building the stadium to have it happen is one part of it. Okay, 5,000 seats to be NCA required. Then maybe we should revisit it at a time when it happens if we're just making laws for things that have never happened before. Well, then you want to have six months of hearings over one little thing that we can fix now. Is is an event that require if it was in the city would require the TUP exempt because it's out of the city? I don't think so. I mean, the, all these findings and everything are made about what an exempt uh, what the what the venue is. The T, the parking is part of that. Okay, when they come in to get a TUP, they have to explain where their parking is. Is it adequate? Does it have traffic control? Does it have a fire extinguisher? All this kind of stuff. But if it's out of the city, nothing. Maybe we just use the existing thresholds that we have built into this. And if it comes in as a parking request, he processes it accordingly. Well, that means everything up to a thousand. So I maybe specifically for parking, do you want to lower the threshold? Yeah. I think that's better than doing nothing because we, we want to like I mean, I, I'm. I guess we don't have really have that much parking. We're par many parking lots that have more than 300 parking spaces. Well, right in downtown, Scott, we got one that has 14 acres. Well, that's you're correct. And it's paved. Um, and it's private. So, my question is, what is the threshold for that? Okay, it's, I would say I, I would say 100. You can uh, say. Hang on, hang on, gentlemen. Mr. Smith, go ahead. No. Oh. I, not to interrupt the discussion, I just I just wanted to say that both minor TUPs and major TUPs include a catch-all provision that allow the director to elevate, and there's there's language on this for a major TUP. So I mean, there's there's a thousand circumstances that could happen. I just want to say that if there is something coming that's complicated, the director would have the ability to move up an event. So technically, yeah, maybe it's exempt, or maybe it's a minor TUP. Director can move an item up, makes pretty general findings. It requires enhanced review by the public and the planning commission to make sure the event will not be detrimental to public health, safety, general welfare, to surrounding neighborhoods, or to the community as a whole. So that's always going to be in the ordinance and will be used, I'm certain. Let me ask you a question. It says it requires advanced 
blah, blah, blah from the planning commission, but I don't know anywhere where it says it has to go to the planning commission. I think he meant to say planning director. Oh, planning director. Well, my question would be, how would the planning director know why this parking was being requested? How would he know? Because he would ask. Is He's this, not going to go, for, John, I don't think that Richard or any other planning director is going to do these approving. If somebody came in tomorrow, this ordinance is all passed, it's approved, and somebody says, hey, can I park 500 cars in Malibu? That's like red flag, okay? We have very intelligent people. He doesn't want to deal with that. He wants that to be a public decision. I just want to point out to you that on our approved list right now, there's a house in Malibu that's an acre and a half and is approved for 500 car parking, 500 people parking. Okay, I just want you to know that's a fact. As a, as a private event? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that theoretically was reviewed by Richard, 500 people. On that's it. totally fine. They, they, they've figured out and come up with a plan that is adequate for him. There's nothing wrong with that. But if... But they went through the process and did that. Now, if, if, like I said, if there's a threshold that we can all agree on and feel comfortable with, if it if the event involves 500 cars, we want it, you know, it needs to be a major thing. We can say that, but you have to say it. We can't just attack, attack, attack. Well, Let's I, come I would, up with a solution. I might. I'm not attacking. I'm saying put some limit on outside event parking outside of the city. I you suggested 250. I will ask for a straw vote for 250, or you can make it 350, or you can make it 100, whatever number you want. I just think it's got to be flagged because we that we by the way have LIP provisions we haven't even put in here, or you can't even park downtown in the summer for events. Okay. Looks like Jeff has a okay, there. Vice Chair uh, Commissioner Jennings. You're muted. You're muted. Jeff, you're muted. Keep <laughs> from coughing. Uh, the, uh, Mr. Smith was was trying to tell you that there is a very flexible uh, ordinance and a, and a, a catch-all provision that allows the director to make a determination and move things up and down. If you if you start creating thresholds where you say, okay, uh, it's 250 cars or 300 cars, and then it goes to a major. Um, now you've also created a, a gap below that. In other words, whereas as proposed by, by staff now, if it's 10 cars and Richard sees a problem, he can elevate that to a major uh, CUP. Uh, if you start putting in saying, okay, now it's 200 cars to go to a major CUP, you're, you're, in a way, you're at least raising the implication that Richard has been deprived of his ability to move it up uh, because it doesn't reach that, that threshold that you put in place. You're safer to allow the language that Mr. Smith gave you to take its effect and, uh, and allow the staff to move things up based upon their vision and, and their, their, their anticipation of what's going on. Um, I, I don't think it's realistic to think if somebody came in and said, uh, I want to park 500 cars uh, and the event is going to be off site. Uh, and, and, you know, Richard's going to ask the question. He's not going to say, oh, okay, it's, it's human sacrifice, right? You're going to be doing that. No, okay, then we need to raise it to a major. I mean, the, the questions are going to be asked. Richard has the discretion to be able to, to move it up to a, C, a, a, a standard CUP without regard to whether you put in a threshold or not. And I know the instinct is to say, well, we can't, we can't really rely on that, but that's what staff does. That's what they're supposed to do. And that's what they do do. Well, I have a question of Joseph. If we put this in, the way this ordinance reads, and you correct me if I'm wrong, Richard can take anything and make it a major TUP if he feels like it. And he can take, somebody could come in with 400 cars, uh, 100 cars that he can make a major TUP. The, this, this, the reason 
we want to make this a major TUP is that it's dealing with events that do not happen in Malibu. There's no other half of the application to judge the use, okay? There's traffic involved. You got to move these cars in and out of the city, okay? Uh, is there anything in the proposed language here that would keep Richard from, it doesn't change anything else in the whole thing, and it doesn't uh, do anything other than say, if it's X number of cars, you got to treat it differently. Uh, it's cars. And then I don't know if there's anything in this section that says it takes care of the restriction on parking in the Civic Center in the summers for events. And and I assume that this is this is governed by the LIP. Uh, you can't just ignore the LIP provisions. So this kind of helps that. Is there, we, is budget, there a little, budget a little in the summer, but it says thou shalt not park public events from what Labor Day to Memorial Day or whatever it is. Thank you, Vice Chair. We 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 understand. Uh, Mr. Well, I didn't get an answer from Joseph. But you're not asking a question. You're just I talking. asked a question. Yes, go ahead. In this provision that stops Richard, Jeff just talked about. Well, this makes it harder for Richard to do that or that. It doesn't change a thing other than outside parking lots. Is that correct? I just need to understand. You're you're saying the proposed language is. Are you talking about adding in a new threshold? And we're talking about adding in a new threshold for parking for events outside of the city. So there there are thresholds. We have the thousand attendee, for example, right? You can add in other thresholds. I think Commissioner Jennings raised the point that it it creates a question, what do you do when something is less than that number? Yes, Richard would have or the director would have the catch-all provision to elevate anything to a major TUP. But what if it's just under, you know, say 250 is the number and they come with 249, right? You got to pick a number. Well, 249, but uh, I think that if, <laughs> if you know, it's it, it's a matter of practice. I, I generally tend to be a little more general in the codes. So that way it gives the flexibility on the staff end to interpret these things when it when it's in front of them. But yes, the commission has the ability to add more thresholds if if you if you desire. So that's. Well, can, can I get Richard to comment on this? What would happen if somebody came in and wanted to rent the Bell property and they had a circus right outside of town and they were going to run it for 60 days or 30 or 14 days in a row five times? Can we get a more realistic hypothetical, John? Well, that's okay. What happens if somebody wants to have the pleasure fair, which is realistic? It happened for 20 years uh, right outside of town. I think we need to go back to the earlier point that I believe the commission, the question came to the commission. The way the code's written right now, there is no prohibition on that. Uh, folks, we, we don't have a not supporting events outside of town. So if something like that major came that we saw a problem with, yes, we'd be elevating it. Um, however, if the commission's concern is that this is going to be a problem, uh, I would ask that the, we make that perhaps part of the recommendation that it be included in the ordinance that parking, uh, when because people do apply for TUPs, that the, the SEP that Commissioner Maza, Vice Chair Maza brought up, where they're parking the cars um, on another property on Winding Way, they're, they're using the horse arena because it's 500 guests and then the events taking place on another property on winding way. If it's the commission's concerned that only situations like that uh, occur, I think it would be good if we could put it as part of our recommendation. Okay, well, yeah. I would recommend that we try for consensus on whatever number Skyler wants to pick as the threshold um, and just have it there. Richard can always still approve it. You still just got to raise it. 
he's got to bring the item up uh, rather than, you know, I don't know. For example, I don't know how you put 250 cars in a horse arena, but uh, that's neither here nor there. It's just it, it should be addressed because it's been announced that $200 million is going to be spent on building this arena for 5,000 seats. Okay. It's been announced. It's going to happen. And there's other things that could happen. That's, that's my only point. Take care of it now. Don't, don't bring it all up when it happens. And it just, it's, it's how often does it happen? It may not happen often. It may happen every other weekend. Okay, straw poll. Richard has the ability to elevate anything to a, a major if he sees cause. And we can say anything beyond 200 cars automatically elevates to a major. Of an outside event. Of an, of event. an outside, outside event. I, I'd put it a different way so we don't have outside event. I would put it uh, use permits that do not involve an event associated with them. And that would be anything outside of the city that would not apply for their circus or whatever it is. I think they can figure out that language. Do, is, is that sound about right? Uh, I, if we're going to go with the threshold, I would go more into the 350 number. Go ahead. I just want to put the caveat out there that I would tend to agree more with Jeff on the fact that I think our planning director has the wherewithal to recognize that stuff. And... So I would like to make the recommendation to council that while we did discuss this parking issue, um, that if they're comfortable with the planning director making that decision, then that's fine. And if not, then the threshold should be 350 and let them decide what they want to do. And we can make that recommendation to them. Well, if we put it in our recommendations, in the ordinance recommendations, that's what they're going to do. They're going to go through all of them and strike the ones they don't like and change the ones they do. So that's that's the process. And I'd be inclined not to put it in and let them figure that out. Or then can you at least give them the language? I don't think we need to change anything. Why? You know that, but that's always true. Uh, it's just... Look, I would just bring it I up. Would, yes, I would be willing to put an asterisk by the parking and say that they, you know, they ought to consider that with the challenge of, or the potential for Pepperdine building a 5,000 seat, you know, theater, how, if they have to deal with this parking thing, they ought to, you know, figure out whatever they want to do with it. I, I, just, I don't, I, I don't know that that's necessarily going to be built. Who knows if they're going to raise the funding for it. They're going to obviously be adding a ton of parking on campus, yada, yada. So Again, I think that I'm. My gut tells me that I'm absolutely comfortable with the planning commissioner's wherewithal and decision making process in deciding that and, and making the recommendation to elevate it or not. Uh, Joseph, can you write that language in a report to the city council? He's muted. Thanks. As I'm hearing it right now. I would be adding, it would say something like PC feedback note, like you saw in this current staff report. It would explain this discussion. It would talk about, uh, yeah, it would say what you just mentioned, Commissioner Peak, about, you know, the director has the ability under the catch-all. If you're not comfortable with that, you could use a, I don't know, 350, whatever the threshold limit is. And just summarize it, a couple sentences. It's another item to send off to the council. That's all we're doing here anyway. Your number? I'm sorry? If he does it that way, is it your number 350, Skyler? Yes. So I, I asked for consensus on that. Which I'd, I'd just said like to see a lower note on, the, on the report to the city council, just like you said. I think we I think yeah, we should fine. just say we they can consider some number and we should move on. Okay, but we're gonna put in a consensus note. I don't think we need to debate the number, really. Yeah, we don't have consensus. What are you going to say in the note? Gee, we talked about this. Don. What to tell you? He just said what he's going to say. It, I think it's fine. They'll, they'll put in a number. Well, I was giving Skyler the chance to put in the number, but okay. Do we okay. have consensus on um, that? 
I believe so. Look, I, I think we have consensus to do what we just asked Joseph to do, which is bring it up to them. Yeah. Say that that's we what I, that's what I'm asking for consensus. Yeah. On, right? yeah. So I think I think that there's consensus on that. You know. Okay. Yeah. Let's move right. on. Okay. I, I had one more. I think Jeff's trying to talk about the item. Oh. I just I, I'm I'm just worried. It's nine o'clock, and this okay. can go on forever. Uh, we need to start taking a series of straw polls and get this thing out of out of our out of our hair. I'm beginning to regret having moved this item in front of. For a, yeah, uh, I, I just said I had one more sort of uh, general question comment, and I wondering if we want to look at that now or do we? It's nine o'clock. Do we want to take a quick break? Let's just let's finish this item, and then we can. We have, to, we have to finish the analysis of the last of the findings, so we've got to move on. Well, I'll, I'll be taking a break pretty soon, regardless. So, um, okay. So. Uh, the, the note says that we would update the TUP fee to be commensurate with staff time spent processing TUPs, but council has since requested an RFP for a fee study. And I and some others are concerned that there's too much emphasis on recouping the staff costs that that should be one factor among several. We should also be thinking about what behaviors does a given fee encourage or discourage, you know, fees and fines mm -hmm. create incentives and disincentives. Um, and from that council hearing, I understand that there must be some state code constraining on how fees can be structured involving things like cost of living increases or, you know, upper and lower bounds of what they can be. But council actually asked the staff for a citation to that code and it was not provided to them. And so I, I think it would be helpful to understand what degree of subjectivity is built into the code. For instance, if it says shell, does it say shall do this precise thing a certain way, or does it say shall consider doing this thing or take this thing into account? Um, so the, the question is to what extent the city has any discretion in designing its fee structure. And you know, the, the well, constitutional basis for that is pretty broad. There's a lot of leeway for what a, a government agency can do as long as it's rational. Uh, it doesn't even have to be reasonable. As long as it's rational, it can be done. So. I think it would be before we talk about fees, we need to talk about what the um, what the state code is and and what the council is going to get out of their RFP. Craig, we don't need to do that because that's a council function. They have a fee schedule study every year and they change the fees. Well, and then I would I would be uh, want to take out the language that says what we're trying to do is update the fee to be commensurate with staff time spent processing to you. Yeah, the reason you don't need to do that is they do it. It's the And Jeff can tell you this is the way they do it because he was on there for eight years. You must have a study of what the common fees are and what your right. costs are. And you cannot right. go over, I believe it's 130% of your costs. It's a very structured thing. And then the city council gives gives discounts for things that they like, okay? But in this case, all we're saying is charge what it costs, the the the, the standard fee. Because, okay. and I'm saying to the extent that there's any leeway or subjectivity involved, that there may be other factors that we would want to try to fold in. I know, but but they are constrained by what the law is. We don't need to discuss it here. But what I think what we need to say here is charge what it takes, which is allowed by the law. There's no question about that, okay? There's an overhead function they have too. But that is, there's no question about that. Charge what it takes, move on. We, you know, whether it's X or X, they have to do that. That's their job. We cannot do it. Yeah, okay. And so I think we keep that because part of the problem here is when you take uh, when you say, okay, staff needs another person, well, there's leeway. There's there's times when it's slow. There's times when it's busy. And you don't want somebody sitting around with their thumb inserted. Uh, if the, that's up to the administration to decide, can I use this guy part-time for this? Can I use an intern for this, et cetera, et cetera? That's up to the administration, not us. So I think we can just leave it the way it is. 
Agree. Yeah, I, I agree with the language. That, uh, All right, let's that, next that, next thing. Let's get yeah, this so moving here. The only thing that we're doing is spending too much time right. talking in circles. I'm, I'm going to yield on my general comments and maybe weigh in on if we do the line by line. Okay. Well, I I I, I do believe we should move on to. Um, I I did have some more questions on some of this, like clarity. Um, Well, I, I think we should move on to 1768060 because we are required to review this. We can't just say, oh, we ran out of time. We're going to skip the last section. Uh, that's what our charter is tonight. And we can go through it. It's only a couple pages and it's findings. It shouldn't take us that long. Um, Chair, do you mind if I lead us through 17.68.060? Uh, Please do. Okay. So, uh, Mr. P. Yep. Um, if you want to put the PowerPoint back up at the back of the PowerPoint, I do have the exactly red line. what I was asking for. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Could you bring the PowerPoint up and just skip ahead? And you're on attachment C. This is attachment C. Yeah, it's the master red line. So keep going down to O six O. There you are. Uh, back one, right there. Not the attachment C I have. Okay, so you're on findings, the bottom of that page? Yeah, so so just to clarify, the, the blue text you see here, this reflects the edits to the existing code based on Zeresis feedback and uh, the last meeting. So if you want to just so we're starting, start walking through these. We're starting, uh, we're starting. John, I think that that would be on page uh, five of nine. Yeah. All right. We're starting with 060, right? right? Correct. So with what we see on the screen now, does it, is there any objection to A being changed okay. as proposed? Okay. This, well, first, my first question is, Richard actually has to make findings, correct? They're written. Is this is a code that says you shall make findings. So when Richard makes a decision, he makes a finding in that decision. Is that correct? Correct, Rueka. Certainly. Can you guys hear me okay? The yeah. microphone is flashing low battery. Uh, correct, like we do now. The right now we put in written findings, so we will continue to do that. And that's available to the public. Yeah, it's included in all of our temporary use permits. Okay, but it's when you give notice, that's in there. You not, not approved it. I don't think that the detailed, I don't think the detailed findings may be in there, but the written notice that it's approved is in there. Well, yeah, but there's an appeal process. And to, in order to appeal, you need to know what the findings were. So when you give notice, I'm assuming, and maybe Patrick has to weigh in on this, that you give the findings. Well, it's like you do in a regular staff report. So the notice would be the the, the mailer, just like, and we could use the example you're using here, Vice Chair. Just like a, a hearing, you you send out a notice ahead of time uh, that just says, "Hey, on this date, this decision will occurred or is going to be occurring." And then in the actual document that uh, the temporary use permit that would be issued by the director, uh, Joseph, we said 14 days? 14. Four, say that again. I'm sorry. I doubled with yes, 14 days. Yes, After, 14 days. 14 days from what? Prior to the event. Yeah, so sorry. This is a, the, the, the edit on the screen, Richard. Um, Oh, it still says 13. Yeah, I need to change me. that. We had to talk about that today. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. That Yeah, that needs to say 14. So okay. 21 days prior to the event, we'd send out a postcard saying, hey, there's going to be an event on this property. It's going to be X amount of people. These are the hours. These are the days. But, but and, you haven't approved it yet, right? Correct. Okay. I have not approved it. And then um, the planning director shall have to re render a decision 14 days. I know we say 13 here, but Joseph and I discussed earlier today, we put 14 days. 
And in that decision is where you would find all the findings. And then uh, if somebody ha then has three days, correct, Joseph, to file an appeal correct. Uh, based on that, that decision that was issued on the 14th day. Okay, well, I have a question on that, and I, I did send an email in on this. If you, as I understand it, the way it reads, and we may have to read this, on the on 14 days prior to the event, you issue your TUP. And what does the public know about it? How are they noticed? So 21 days prior to the event, properties within the, the radius area would receive a notice. Uh, that notice would also give the date of, and that's what we do right now, uh, we provide information on when the permit is going to be issued. Always. Correct. Right? They can count on, if you say, I'm going to issue it 14 days before. But the way, the way I read it, you mail this notice, right? On a, on 21 days prior to the you event. You don't mail anything when you make the decision. You don't say yes or no, or uh, I made this decision, or I'm notifying you I made this decision, or providing it to anybody. Uh, we would provide, if somebody were to ask to be an interested party based off the mailing, we definitely would provide them with the document. Okay, and do they have to be within 500 feet? No, anybody can be in, a, in an in interested party. Okay, and can anybody ask for all decisions? Isn't that a public record? He, he, yes. Yeah, and what I'm wondering is, I, the way I read it, the way I read it, it said, okay, then you get three days to appeal, and, and, and they mail it on that day. Well, the mail, you usually issue opinions on Fridays anyway, but the, the, the mail... You can't, and it says you have to appeal with all your detail in three days. Um, not just the way we normally do it. You appeal, and then you got 10 days to fill out all the objections. So it sounds to me like unless you go stand at City Hall on that day and try to get a copy of it, you don't have a chance in hell of appealing. It, and, and it doesn't seem like that's adequate notice for an appeal. And I don't know whether that's common law, state law, city law, or whatever, but you have if you if you're going to appeal and you require that they answer all the findings why it shouldn't have been approved, how can they do that in that period of time? Three days does seem really quick. And and they have to get the document also. If it's issued at 4.30 on a Friday night, they're out of luck. Is the reference to three days, is that three working days? Well, it, it, go ahead. I'm <laughs> sorry. It, so the three days comes from our current code. Uh, it's a little funky the way it works, but it, it says the applicant has three days to appeal the decision. And that was taken and then applied more broadly to be the applicant or any member of the public uh, because the concern was um, they uh, joseph help me out here if i fail on this one i believe the idea was to keep things moving so that a hearing could be had before the event date that's that's i mean that's the way that i read it with the with the timeline because right. otherwise you'd have no ability to, to have a hearing before the event Right. And well, you can under certain circumstances, you've got two weeks, but under a normal appeal, the appellant has the right to listen to a hearing and listen to the decision by us. That's the only, basically the appeal. In the case of a written appeal that isn't in public record, uh, three days before you have to have a full answer to it seems to me not a very defensible thing when somebody appeals four days later or whatever it is. I mean, 
I've tried to get stuff at City Hall on 4.30 at Friday. Ain't nobody there. That's because they close at 4.30. Mr. Smith. I know that's Andre. because that's why they issue these, these things at 4.30. Okay, Vice Chair, hang on. Mr. Oh. Smith, go ahead. Yeah, so just to answer Commissioner Peake's question, it's, it is three business days. That is clarified lower down in the appeals section. Um, this is referring to calendar days. Okay. That's why it doesn't say business days, but it's it's calendar days there. The the last thing I'll just share on this this topic is one of the one of the issues that you know this this ordinance update was intended to try and resolve several issues that are happening. The timelines for the TUPs have been problematic. Uh, in this case, minor TUPs these could be small events. You know, sometimes and Richard knows this they're they're organized sort of at the end of the hour. They realize they need a TUP. They talk to the planning department. Okay, you know, they want to comply. They get everything in. It's just the timelines don't always match up. And so you have situations where there's just a, a, a realistic nature to how much time you can build in before a minor TUP occurs. This ordinance is trying to find a balance that kind of weighs it all. You've got 45 days prior to the event. I know some applicants have expressed that's hard to make. We heard that in the Zeracis discussions. A 21 day notice is the biggest notice period we have for code amendments, variances. Uh, TUPs are being reflected in that same spirit. So there's a notice constraint. The director decision, it is intended, Commissioner Mazza, to get to your point that the, the document is available during the notice period if somebody has a question on a minor TUP, they could, they could observe it and see what that is. And then there's time purposely built in for that three day appeal period you know, and then to Richard's point, trying to get this to a hearing still to try to hit the date of the event, right? It's just, it's a lot of dates matching up. And this is this is why TPs take so long to process is because to manage all these dates with the number of TPs the cities get, it's it's a lot of it's a lot of paperwork and housekeeping. So anyway, that's the intention behind these time frames. Of course, if you want to adjust them. And the commission wants to do that for the city council, then then please make those recommendations. But this well, is let, let me ask you this: Is the TUP will it? Is it? Is it when he issues it? When it's available? Is it going to be on the city website available when he issues it, or does it come like it normally does three or four days later? And. Uh, John, I think it's, I, I think Richard's made it clear that it's, it's in, in the city's intention to have it published as soon as possible on the website, as soon as it's available. But we really need to move this conversation along. Know, so but this is more very concerns important. about that. This is, you got to remember, this is very important. If somebody is denied due process, you're going to cancel. I, 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 I share, I absolutely agree with you. I think it's so important. So I'm just trying to put it down. Work Are you back. Happy? So we have to work back in the calendar because that's the only way that to make this work. The only reason why we're dealing with this is because it's been problematic. That's what staff has already stated. So we're looking at ways and they're proposing ways for to make it easier. Okay. And I'm just asking them to propose ways that make it legal. And that would be that somebody, for example, a regular appeal, you can go in and say, oh, gee, there's, I got to have appeal tomorrow morning. You could go in and throw a piece of paper at them. As I appeal, you've got 10 days to, to, to research it. Here, you have so three let's, days to let's, find let's, out that it happened. Okay, let's, 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 direct the, let's direct the question to the city attorney and ask him very simply, is what is proposed adequate for the appeal process? Yes or no? From a purely legal due process standpoint, I am content that three days is sufficient to ensure the due process of any appellant. However, if the if the commission's role or prerogative was to extend that, that is entirely fine as well. Okay, now, uh, Patrick, if if somebody came in and said, in fact, I could not get that in three days, it was issued Friday night, and whatever. It wasn't I went in I to get it. I said they had three working they days. Have, they have a, a constitutional right to review an action taken by a director. All our other appeals have the ability to have time to answer. This one, for example, if they mailed it, there's no chance. So if it's not on the 
it's not on the on the site, there's really no chance. Uh, well, we, we're we're a pretty close knit town, so I guess if you got in your car and drove down into City Hall, you'd have plenty of time. And the other thing is. This is only a 500 foot radius. Am I not correct here? Does that still stick the 500 square foot or the 500 foot radius? So we're not talking about all 9,000 of us here in town that are going to rush to try and appeal something, Vice Chair Mazza, if that's what you're always talking about. So I, I think if they really, if it's that a big a deal to them, they'll drive down to the city hall. They won't they know about it. it. And this, this is appealable by anybody in the city. This is not limited to 500 feet. Correct. If all I'm saying is you tell them something's happening, you tell them what it is, and give them the right to appeal. I think when you okay, so have I, a process, I, I, John, I I very much agree with you. I think everybody's in agreement with you that everybody should have that right. And our city attorney just said they have that right. No, so he said if, he said we have the right to do that. It so the question for you is: right. if, if you don't feel that three days is enough time. Then propose something different. Okay, Let's move propose, this along. I propose that, that, that they have to have three days to appeal and seven days to uh, answer the appeal questions. Because you, so you you're can, making it 10 days. Well, right now it's 20 for a regular appeal. Okay, so so the the challenge with doing that is that, that that you have to work backwards from those days to get all the other days corrected. Am I correct on that, Joseph? Well, yeah, and I just want to make it make a point that this conversation actually is not the findings section. If we go down further to 080, that's the appeal section. Well, I don't think we're going to get there today if we keep going at this pace, but. Well, that the discussion we're having right now about adjusting the three day what it should what yeah. it should read is really a different section. I just okay, so let's leave it like this. We have full consensus that the appeal process seems a little bit short. Are, are we in agreement on that or no? Yes. Yeah. No. 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 And Jeff. Jeff, yeah or nay? Um. No. No. It's okay. I'm not in consensus that it's a little bit short. I, I think three of us think it's a little bit short. I would just, again, sort of like the last item, just put an asterisk. Like, it's not the end of the world. If, if the council thinks that that's enough time, that's enough time. But just, I would merely put a note in there. When you get to uh, 080, just make sure that they look at that. And I'm content with that. Yeah. As long as we're I'm content with that. Okay. Okay. Uh, and, and I hope our attorneys check that there's a section in our municipal code that says all decisions by the planning corrector are appealable. I hope it's consistent with that. Okay. So, uh, 1A. W anything else on this page that we have an issue with? And specifically call it out if you do and what the proposed solution is. So, so you're talking about down to 4D? Correct. Okay. Um, I'm fine. Really? Okay. Um, Great. Yeah. Next one. I'm sorry. On, on on four, adequate temporary parking, on site or alternate locations acceptable to the director. Do do we want to have any more specificity about what the requirements might be about shuttles or off site parking locations? No. Leave, leave, leave that, that up open to the planning ended? director. Leave that up to the planning director. Yeah. Okay, I guess that's that's where the uh, inertia will be then. <laughs> move on. <laughs> okay. Um, anything up to B? So anything on five E six seven eight nine ten? We don't have that. Can can you put it up? I have something on. On. We can go yeah. to the next slide. Next slide. Yeah. G. We might have lost them. <laughs> okay. You have something on what was that, John? Eight G. Yeah. Um, what I'm wondering is. This is a Patrick question. Why is it the Los Angeles District Attorney's Office when we have a district attorney? What do they have to do with it? In terms of the the the, the, the complaints, yeah, I mean, maybe they're yeah, that's 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 a, a good point. Maybe maybe include both. 
Okay, so I would I would hope that we have consensus that we say or the city's district attorney, and we yeah. do have one. And so it's it, the city prosecutor. City is. Pros prosecutor, yeah. So you mean either either or is that their direction, John? Yeah, either. Either. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm good with that, Joseph. Yeah, I just um, Patrick, can you just uh, read the statement that it should. So with the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office, what? Or the city prosecutor's office during the 24 months preceding the date of the application submittal. Okay. All right. Anything else, John, through 10? Uh, on number nine, uh, and this one I think is really important, is, let's see, nine. It says this, the proposed does not have any active violations on the city file unless otherwise considered not applicable to the proposed use and resolve its satisfaction of the code enforcement officer. Okay, well, I want to give an example. The, the car event at Malibu Inn, okay? They got busted twice. They paid a fine. The way this reads, they're home free. They can do it next weekend. Now, the thing that's really wrong with our, our code enforcement is it is cheaper at the present time and probably in the future not to ask for a TUP or CUP. It is cheaper than mailing the labels, getting the valets, following the rules, filing the papers, et cetera, to just violate it, pay the fine, and go on. And I think we need to say other than prior TUP violations. Because if we have somebody who's the scofflaw, who does it five or six times a year, I'll just, just get caught. If somebody turns me in, I'll get caught. I'll pay 500 bucks or 300 bucks or whatever it is. Jeff, I have a proposal. No way can John, I understand the point. Jeff? Yeah. Um, in soccer, uh, when you're when you're refereeing a situation, you don't necessarily look at the particular foul. If a guy is habitually being using too much force, you can card him for that. So you can put in a provision here that gives the planning director the option of saying this guy's a habitual offender and you know there's just been too many complaints about this property even though none of them are active now uh but he's an habitual uh, offender and, and we're not going to grant it on that basis so patrick can we put some language in there that specifically says any habitual offenders will not be allowed to have temporary use permits <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I think if that's the, the consensus and, and direction of the commission, our office can work with Mr. Smith and, and, and get something that effectuates that, particularly with an eye toward, I just want to make sure that I understand, with violations of this TUP section. Would it, would it be more workable to say, just take out the active and replace it with within the past two years or whatever? They do not have any, have not had any in the past two years? Well, we count by 12 month periods. So uh, on, on the use, so we probably ought to keep it to 12 months or the prior 12 months. Well, we had two years on, on a previous one. We just talked okay, about well, two years is fine, but the only but thing the reason for the two years and when you do this is this says code enforcement officer. Okay. It should say, and the planning director. And then this, and and with and it should have some language that says, with with special emphasis on. Okay, so let, UP I, violations. Let's add code enforcement. Let's add planning director in addition to code enforcement officer, if that's needed. And let's say that if there's any violations within a, you know the preceding year, that um, the what are we saying that the TUP should not be issued? Correct. Or, or do we want to put language in there that just says any habitual offenders should be uh, taken with the highest scrutiny and uh, not allowed? Because he might just continue that gets, just to be a habitual but, offender and you may not resolve anything. <laughs> well, that gets political. I think in general, you should be consistent with everybody. Uh, Richard can decide how many, but at a certain point. Okay. Um, Patrick, can you and Joseph work on some language that kind of gets the gist of what we just referenced? Sure can. Okay, great. Why, why is it 24 months in the preceding section? And now because it takes a really long time to have something go to the uh, city prosecutor's office and the district attorney. And the code enforcement officer. It, it takes a while, yes. 
So we're saying uh, uh, only a year is suitable in this one case? Well, I think that something that's going to come to our code enforcement and planning director is going to be yeah. in the preceding year. It's a shorter time frame. Yeah, true. Okay. And and the point is that John was saying that it's, you know, the guys are doing it last weekend and it's just easier to pay the fine and then, and then do it again next week. You know, we're not talking about a long-term issue here. We're talking, right, right, right. at least that's what John presented. Is a yeah, that's good. Issue. Again, the goal is compliance. That's good. Um, all right. So going on to B, anything? Wait, 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 wait. Where are you? Anything for the bottom half of the page, B, okay. one, two, three, four, five, six. No. Okay, again, the number eight, uh, I want to add again the city prosecutor in that language. Yeah, next slide. Wait, on seven or eight? Wait, wait, wait. Is that eight? No, six. I'm sorry, six, six, six. six. I got to go back a page. Just be consistent. Yeah. Are we good with that, Joseph? Yep. Okay. We yep. can stay on this page then. Uh, anything on seven or eight? Um, I, I think on seven, you want to put the 24 months in there, or the 12 months in there, right? Yeah, I'll, we'll add the same language uh, with be the consistent with office. It. Perfect. Yep. All right. Um, Okay, I'm, I'm taking a five minute break. So if anyone wants to join me. No, we only have two pages. Nature calls, sorry. Go ahead, you still have a quorum. Okay. All right. We'll keep going, if that, whatever you wanna do, Chair. Yeah, keep going. Okay. Um, yeah. 070, let's go A through F. John? Uh, okay. O seven O A through F, nothing. G through L. What through L? G, the yeah. remainder of the page. Nothing. All right. Can we go to the next slide? Joseph, by the way, the slide is very helpful. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thanks to technology. <laughs> um, anything on M? Yeah. M is in Mary. No. Or Masa. <laughs> M is in Mazda. Okay. Anything on N for no? <laughs> Why don't you just ask the whole page and it'd be faster? Well, the, okay, great. There we go. <laughs> now you're at my speed. Anything else on the page? Nope. Okay. Um, last page. By the way, Craig is going to be completely shocked if we get through this by the time he comes back. <laughs> Yeah, we'll be gone and he'll be looking, he'll be looking at, at nothing. Uh, anything on the last part of this, John? I'm on one, yes. Uh, and I just want to read his change here. Well, all I know is what we talked about earlier. Okay, the uh, question is, how much is the filing fee? I mean, these are, these are. Great question. Quick, no hearing deals. Uh, if there's $700, I think. Like it is to appeal a, a CDP, I think that's absolutely ridiculous. This is a, a one piece of sheet of paper. It's not a. It's not a. a but it does require staff time and potentially a lot. Well, do you think? Well, do you think it reply it requires anything like anything that we ever hear? No, it's not a CDP report. It's just Richard's opinion. And uh, I, I consider by, Richard's opinion to be extremely valuable and it his time be valuable. But is it equate if somebody appealed to Malibu Inn, where staff probably has a thousand hours, would it compare to this? Is it the same fee or is it a different fee? 
about 45 minutes ago, you were arguing that setting the fees is not our job. It's the city council. No, but there's no 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 reference to what the what it what it's for. Those, okay. those so, fees John, are John, really John, John, fee. don't we want the fees to be the job of the city council? We want them to be different, at least in note. The, the, uh, given so by you the, want to put a note in there that says that the fi the appeal fee for this should reflect the amount of time it takes staff to deal with it and be consistent across the board. Or do you want to give it a specific number that you would like to suggest? There's what like eight years say, the city council does for you right there. I would Thank like you. to say, I would like to have a note that city council should consider this a minor appeal and not the same fee structure as a full CDP appeal. Full CDP. You know, I that, think that you would find consensus on that within the commission fee. that we would like the fee to be reasonable. Yeah. Do I have, is there a consensus on that, that they, there should be a note in there yeah, that the fee should that. be reasonable? I, hope so. I agree. I agree. Okay. Craig. Yeah. We just to go to a vote on this. Did we lose you for anything super important during that time? I don't know. You tell me. I don't, I don't think, think so. that we did other than we just made it, uh, the recommendation that the city council, um, look at the fee and make a reasonable fee, but it should not be the same fee as a CDP appeal fee. Uh, that's, I would agree with that. There you go. Amen. Okay. All right. Do we need to take further action on this or do we have the recommendations to give to council? Do we, need we have the recommendations to give to council? Do we, are we going to review uh, what they write? No, because it, we're not going to get to the next item if we do that. But we're no, I'm, no, no, no. At the next meeting, do we bring it back for to get oh. the final resolution? Normally, I don't know if we need to or not, Patrick. Well, normally when we make law, we do. This is just a recommendation. Those other resolutions, when there's a chance that the planning commission is the final decision maker, the vice chair is correct. We like to take things a bit slower. We like to make sure all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed. In this instance, I have confidence that my office can work with uh, Director Mullica as well as Mr. Smith to reflect the changes made. However, that is the that is the prerogative of this commission. Should you want to see it and have it come back, that you can you can direct that via the uh, resolution here. Or if not, if you have trust and faith in us, you can say please recommend as as amended tonight to the city council. Uh, I just want to make one that'll last my, comment, and this is. That'll be my motion. Excuse me, John. That'll be my motion okay. and my second. Okay. I just want to make one last comment. I think it's maybe wise for us to continue because the Malibu Film Society this morning announced they had a deal with Bruce Silverstein and uh, uh, Paul Grisanti to okay the theater. Now, even before the laws passed, so the council is obviously heading in a different direction than what we just went through. So we may want to hear what that is. But won't, John, hold on, mind. hold on. Won't the council that's making that decision have the ability to do that when this is in front of them? Well, we might as well, if we want to recommend, we might as well recommend what they want us to, what they want recommended, rather than have a whole new thing happen. This apparently. There's probably 10 provisions in here that make that hard, what they're planning on doing. But that's their call. We, we all we can do, as, as Mr. Donegan said, we're I just making recommendations. I don't know how much more time we want to spend on this. If they want to take more time to dissect it, that's, that's their, their prerogative. That's their deal. We've already spent enough time here. And, and, and the problem is that there isn't really a way that we could do this because it's a recommendation, apparently, of two council members uh, what would we have them do? Come and make a presentation of what they propose to hopefully be able to get three votes on. Oh, uh, there's going to be a staff report. Report. And then we, there's going to be a staff. It's, it's going to be. If a they staff. want to change it. They can change it. Yeah. Okay. So and, can we get a? Uh, can I ask a quick question before we vote? Uh, do we have to vote. We're just making a recommendation. Well, we, no, there, there is a, a, a formal resolution okay. that needs to be moved and okay. adopted, right. and all these changes will be attachment A. Okay, great. Now, Tad, this obviously takes a while to become law. Okay, so 
if the council did an action before they adopted this ordinance, they follow the present municipal code. So in other words, to take an action against the present municipal code, this has to pass the council. Is that correct? And go to the what coastal commission? And so and so I I am a bit reluctant to to answer this this hypothetical. I will only state that you are correct. The the changes suggested here tonight, which as amended, which staff will pass on, are not existing city law right now. So yes, what what currently exists in the municipal code sh governs. Now there's a, a myriad of potential options the city council may do. They can adopt an urgency ordinance. They can, you know, I, 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 I'm not sure exactly what it is that you are getting at. I will say though, to reiterate and answer your question directly, what you guys propose here is not good law until it is formally adopted by the by the city council. Correct. Yeah. Very good. So, be, uh, Mr. Smith, you got your hand up. Yeah, I just uh, back to clarifying the motion, just the Commissioner Jennings. So, uh, the last slide I had on there had the Planning Commission resolution with all the edits we brought back, plus the edits tonight. Um, there was also the language about the 14 day director timeline ad that we were requesting. I just want to make sure that it is all that reflected in the motion. Yes. That's all. Okay, let's take a vote. Commissioner Jennings? Yes. Commissioner Peak? Yes. Commissioner Hill? Yes. Vice Chair Mazza? No. Chair Smith? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, I'm sure everybody's got to gotta go somewhere for real quick. So we'll what, take five minutes and then come back and we got just one, right? Yep. Chair, Chair Smith? Yes. I will not be returning. I have to recuse myself on that item. Uh, uh, Vice Chair Mazza, for the record, it's just due to the proximity of your residence, correct? Yes, I'm within, I'm within 500 feet. Thank you very much, Vice Chair. Okay, five minutes, you guys.
Uh oh. Can you still hear me? Construction. Uh oh. Here, yeah, whenever you're ready to go. Okay. We have. I don't see Skyler yet, but. We are also missing John. Oh, that's right. Never mind. <laughs> We're just missing Skyler. That's okay. You can miss John. <laughs> don't don't tempt us. <laughs> Ah, uh, I'm here. There we go. Okay, Adam, it's all yours, boss. Okay, thank you, Chair. Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, my internet has been a little unstable tonight as well, so I might have to turn my my camera off if that's occurring. Just a heads up. Uh, but the project for you tonight is a coastal development permit, Woolsey Fire application twenty one dash zero zero five, located at six six four two Zumiras Drive. Next slide, please. Uh, here's just a quick look at the vicinity map um, of the property along Samira's Drive. Uh, there previously was a house there that burned down in the Woolsey Fire. Next slide, please. There's the current site conditions. Um, currently, there's just a, a mobile home or two on there um, waiting for uh, the application to go through. Next slide, please. And just another look at the site conditions. Next slide. So the proposed project is a 4,691 square foot, one story single family residence, uh, a 2,686 square foot basement, 737 square foot detached garage, a 227 square foot detached surf shack with trellis, a pickleball court, swimming ball, a swimming pool, spa, and associated equipment, on-site wastewater treatment system, Landscaping and hardscaping, grading and retaining walls. Next slide, please. Uh, in addition, there is a discretionary request for a minor modification to reduce the front yard setback by no more than 50%. Uh, regarding this lot in particular, the allowed uh, or required uh, front yard setback would be 63 feet 4 inches. Uh, the applicant is proposing the 31 feet 8 inches, meeting that threshold of 50%, by no more than 50%, I should say. Next slide, please. Here's just a quick look at the site plan uh, with the proposed structure on the front half of the lot and the rear half of the lot is mainly occupied by uh, slope. Next slide, please. Here's just a closer look uh, at the uh, minor modification request. Uh, so the primary structure is located at 63 feet, four inches, which is the required front yard setback. It's the accessory structure, which is the surf shack and trellis that is uh, being placed at 31 feet, 8 inches, uh, which is the minor modification request. Next slide, please. So as you know, with any minor modification, it requires findings. And uh, we did a quick analysis of the neighborhood to determine the front yard setbacks of the houses in the vicinity. Uh, the properties highlighted in blue were analyzed uh, for their front yard setbacks. And you can see on the chart in the, on the right that almost half of the, uh, the, the properties that were analyzed have front yard setbacks of roughly 30 feet uh, or less. And uh, staff felt that the findings could be made uh, for the minor modification. Next slide, please. In addition, we wanted to do a quick PVD analysis to ensure that no views were being blocked. Uh, the two PVDs uh, in the area were at 6500 Zuma View Place and 6716 uh, Zumiras Drive. As you can see on the bottom one, 6716 Zumiras, that wouldn't be affected by any uh, development on the subject property. It was really relegated to the Zuma View Place uh, PVD. Next slide, please. This is the image uh, that would be looking directly at the subject property. As you can tell, there's uh, a lot of vegetation in the way, and uh, there would be no impact to the PPD with the proposed structure. Next slide, please. This is just a quick look at 
the front and rear elevations of the proposed single story single family home. Next slide, please. Uh, and in sum, staff recommends the Planning Commission finds that the proposed project is consistent with CEQA and approves the proposed project as conditioned. Thank you. Thank you. Um, disclosures. Commissioner Jennings? None. Commissioner Hill? Uh, a couple, yeah. Um, when we were about to hear this before, I did have some email with uh, Planner Pisarkowitz about what kind of development is or isn't allowed in four to one slopes on Point Doom. And we'll talk about that. Um, also, uh, I was finally feeling better this past week. So I got up there on Wednesday and took a, a little hike out on the site and discovered that the there's a real discontinuity between the the plans, the story poles, the survey, and what's actually out there on the ground with respect to where that slope lays relative to the proposed construction. Um, so we can get into details on that too. Um, and other than that, I think that's uh, all. Okay, Commissioner Peak. No conversation with the applicant about it other than I did uh, visit the the site, but I only from the, the street. Before I had none. So um we gotta go to the applicant here, right? Yes, if you'd like to open the public hearing, the public comment portion of the hearing. Public comment, yes, thank you. Um our first speaker will be Doug Burge of uh, Burge and Associates. Also available to respond to commission questions are Kayvon Tahari, uh, who's the owner, Kaylee Ryan, project manager, and Jennifer Hoppel, who is the project's architect. Um, so that uh, could open for Doug. Yeah, good evening, commissioners. Can you hear me okay? We can. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to touch on a little bit of the staff report. I appreciate the staff for putting this all together and putting together a complete presentation. Just a couple of points um, that I wanted to make to kind of add some color to some of the things we're talking about. Um, just to be clear, um, because of a fire rebuild nature on this property, the existing trailers that are on there actually have a, a permitted use, a temporary use for those uh, for those trailers. So they're just not stored on there. Um, just to clear that up. Uh, the other thing that will come up tonight, um, as alluded by Mr. Hill, um, is that um, we have to start every project from a licensed surveyor who tells us exactly what the slopes are. Um, that color code of slope analysis tells us exactly where we are. We are not over or on any four to one slopes, which is very critical. The other thing that'll come up is that uh, what has to be understood is that um, there's flat, which people consider flat is flat, but as you get to the four to one slopes, obviously something is sloping. So it may appear that maybe you don't have a proper distance, but our plans are not allowed to cheat, as you sit, might, 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 somebody might say, but we have to allude to that. We also have a very, we have about half the property to work with, and we also think we have a great design, meaning we kept a neighborhood to 18 feet, and so we wanted to be able to respect that and not have any issues with uh, anybody's PVD, let alone the owner wanted to have a one-story house and we have um, that part on the site and we weren't able to really develop the back part because that is untouchable slopes that you can develop as is most of Point Doom. So again, the survey is the survey. It tells us exactly, um, unless there's some evidence to the contrary, that's exactly how we designed it. We had to get the fire truck behind there. This is another house very similar in nature to its neighbor where we did the reverse kind of floor layout where we're going behind the home to enter. So the garages are on the backside. And then as you're in the front yard is then the primary yard because that's where the sun is, that's where the pool is, and that's where the entertaining is. And so that's why we designed it in this method. So we pushed the house as far as we can to the back knowing that we needed 20 feet minimum to get the fire truck around there and the hammerhead. And then the garages are also set in that same position. So. Again, we may, one may dispute it, but again, we are standing behind our surveyor's survey. 
Um, the other thing is the minor mod is just for a piece of the building. It's the surf shack. It's no more than 10 feet tall. One could say that you could go to 18 feet tall. So it's only 10 feet tall. And same with the trellis, a very minor part. And also to be pointed out that the previous home that burnt down was already in the uh, reduced front yard setback. So uh, the previous home was in that setback. And again, it's proven by the exhibits that we're not asking for anything that is not a neighborhood standard. Um, the other thing that came up a month ago with the previous home uh, by neighbors that asked about construction parking, that has been addressed in this report. That is the paragraph, standard construction paragraph from the city. That's included the landscape plan that was missing on the previous project is included. And our landscape plan is 100% approved by the city biologist. And so there are a few new trees in there that are obviously need to be compliant trees. Um, but as far as any grading, any other things going on in that area, there is nothing going on. So we are here to answer any questions. The owner is also here. We're excited to um, get this thing approved and we're excited to uh, have this home um, be built. So thank you very much for your time. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker will be Pat Healy. Um, if you are present in the meeting and would like to speak on the item and have not signed up in advance to do so, please click the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. Good evening, commissioners. Um, the Coalition for Slow Growth is asking that the condition of approval of the project <clears throat> I have the applicant make the following changes so that it conforms to the LCP. LIP 4.3 states streams or Escher, whether they're mapped or not. LIP 4.7.2 confirms that all the canyons in Point Doom are Escher and the canyons of streams both shall be accorded all Escher protection. On Point Doom, new development shall be designed to avoid encroachment on slopes, both the irrigation plan and the non-native landscaping plan is in violation of the LIP. We question the wisdom in this instance of landscaping on slopes steeper than four to one, since all the residents on Point Doom that burned in the Wolseley fire were destroyed by the fire racing up the canyon slope and igniting residents. This landscape plan greatly increases the fire risk. A slow growth requests that this project specifically be conditioned um, to exclude um, irrigation, clearing, and planting as shown in the staff report exhibit L3.0 and L4.0. Uh, as an aside, the staff report doesn't include the re required biological study, nor does it require the approval of fish and grain. The front yard setback includes a pickleball court and a fire pit, which is not in keeping with the neighborhood character. When passing by the project, one will see a pickleball court and a fire pit because all the front yard hedges or fences can't be under the code exceeding 42 inches inches in height. Also, um, certain findings can't be made. They were, they're listed in um, our written um, correspondence. So we're not actually asking that you deny the project, but only condition the project to keep the irrigation and landscaping off the four to one slopes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Healy. And, uh... Doug, from the applicant team, would you care to provide rebuttal? Yeah, just a couple pieces um, or clarifications. Uh, in a front yard, you can have a six foot fence and just 42 inches can be solid. So anything in the front yard um, would be in compliance in this case. And then um, also on the, on the landscaping, again, the city biologist, which we we have to go by what is their interpretation of the code and their interpretation of the code is what is allowing this to get uh, our project approved. So we're standing by that also. Thank you. Thank you. And I don't see any raised hands. So I believe that concludes public comment. Okay, back to us. Commissioner Hill, your hands up. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, Adam, would you, or I don't know who's in charge of it. Would you please put up the photograph that I submitted on the, the rear of the site? Um, well, Sorry, Commissioner Hill, did you send that to Alex or Parker or just the one in, embedded in the email that you had sent last I week? Sent it, I sent it to you and you said you would include it in your presentation or you'd put it in the stack. Okay, let me, uh, let me send it over to Alex right now. He'll put it up. Um, so I'll try to give some background on this. Um, when I was looking at the section drawings, or I'm sorry, the elevation drawings, um, I guess they're sections. There were a couple places, sheet A.3 and 3.1, where it shows the driveway edge is going over the top of the slope, which is really the top edge of that ravine. And that kind of piqued my interest, not least because we not too long ago had a similar point doom case where there was a driveway that hung over the ravine, a ravine. But in that case, it was cantilevered and we decided, well, it's not touching the slope, so it's, it's okay there. But in this case, there's a retaining wall proposed to be holding the driveway on that slope. So I was specifically interested in seeing what that really looked like back on the back side of the site. Um, do, are we close to having the picture yet? I'll just try to vamp here a little till we get it. Um, hey, Craig, question for you. Are you referencing the drawing on A3.1? Is that what I heard you say? Uh, uh, sheet A.3 and 3.1 show um, the section the elevation views. That that's what piqued my interest. That's my my main point is going to be illustrated by the photograph. Okay. The main concern, basically. Uh, so I went around the back side of the lot. I just approached it from the adjoining site because the the whole main the flat part of the lot is enclosed in a fence. And on the back side of the lot, the story poles are contiguous with the back side of that fence. In other words, the corner of the house that the driveway wraps around, uh, we call that the southeast corner. Um, those story poles are contiguous with the fence. The fence has is made of a four foot tall uh, rolled material on star pickets, and then the story poles extend above that. And so it's really easy to tell based on the measurement of the, the width of that fencing material that about eight feet away from that, those story poles, there's a stump uh, beyond which the ground slopes away precipitously. In other words, there's flat area beyond the edge of the story poles for about 10 feet, not, not significantly more if at all. And then beyond that, it slopes away in a way that to get down there, you would have to, somebody's talking, to, to, to get down that um, slope, you'd have to, oh, here, here we go, here's the photograph. All right, so I first see that on the right side, you see the story poles. And on the far left side is the, the gully. Um, you can see right contiguous with the story poles is the uh, fencing with the rolled material and the star pickets. And so that fencing is like four foot high material, which by using that as a scale, you can see that the kind of gray patch is a, is a cut down stump to the, at the bottom, just left of center. Do you all see that gray patch? That's, that's the stump. That's about eight feet away from the, the, the poles. Beyond that, to the left of that stump, the hillside slopes down precipitously such that to climb down it, you would actively have to grab onto bushes, or if you had a rope, you'd use that, but you're not walking down that slope beyond that stump. It's steep. So upshot here is they're trying to wrap a 25, uh, a 20 foot width turn around the corner of those story poles and they've got 10 feet of flat before it just drops off and I don't know if this is 
you know, a problem with the survey or were the story polls not placed in the right place? I, you know, I, I can't assign the blame, but the fact is that what's on paper does not correspond to the ground out there. Um, and I know that, you know, a common rejoinder is, well, we, you know, we, when we do the contours on the slope study, the, 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 the spacing of the contours can affect uh, how the, what numbers we perceive in the slope. But here, it's not even close. I mean, it's just whether you use a foot contour or, or you know, 50 feet, <laughs> not that you'd use 50, but the point being that that, that rationale doesn't, doesn't fix this. And uh, I think this is a real problem on this site. I don't know how it arose. I don't know, and I guess it's not my job to apportion blame, but it just simply doesn't work out there. If, if I understand correctly what you're saying, Craig, if you were to look at A3.1. I think shows sort of the elevations uh, coming down towards the rear of the property. Yeah, you've got the, you've got a, a couple of those images on that show. There are different sections <clears throat> with the driveway extending out and showing it as extending it a, over a little bit of slope um with a retaining wall there the problem here is this the, the in reality the slope actually peels away sooner much sooner and more steeply than is drawn on that plan so uh, what i was asking you is that i mean the way that i look at this is that 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 end of that that metal pole that's sticking up that's holding that uh string line there yeah uh like kind of in the not the one in the right corner, but you know, about a quarter of the way in, kind of in line with the eucalyptus tree, where it kind of V's out there. Yeah, the, uh, you're, maybe you're pointing line. pointing to the corner of the house, right? Yeah, so that's kind of that that corner here where I would be looking on the sheet A three point one that I was talking about. Yeah, where it says like foyer. You follow uh -huh. me? Well, it, this is the this is the driveway. It's it's further to the right of where it says foyer. Oh, correct. But does this string line indicating the driveway, or is this string line indicating the building? The string line is indicating, indicating the building. It's indicating the building. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so I I just wanted to make sure I was referencing the same area, so I understand what you're saying. Right. So you need you need twenty feet of flat hanging out beyond the string line for the driveway. And yes, they're they're suggesting that they could put a little bit of a retaining wall, but the I can't put an exact number on it, but the retaining wall that would be required to make a 20 foot wide driveway here would be at least twice as tall as what the drawing depicts there. Okay. Um, and regardless, once we're onto the slope on Point Doom, there's no development. You can't put a retaining wall on a slope. And so I think this is really distinguishable for even, even if you thought these, these drawings were exactly accurate, this is distinguishable from the one that we approved where we said, um, well, it's okay that it hangs out uh, literally a couple feet over the slope because it's cantilevered and it's not touching the slope. That was the rationale we all came up with. Here, you know, you're actually act actively putting a retaining wall on a on a four to one slope. So that's not that's prohibited on point yet. So I mean, there are other issues with this project, ASHA concerns and and setback concerns and other thoughts I have in mind. But this this right up front just seems like this calls for the back to the drawing board. I mean, unless they were to show that. Whoever put the, for example, put the story poles up 10 feet further back than they were supposed to be, or, you know, I, again, I don't know where the error is, but it's just the on the ground conditions don't match what we see on paper. Okay, can, it looks like the applicant, the architect yeah. has a hand raised. Jennifer, can you, uh, can we open her mic up? Let's hear that. Who's the project manager? Doug is the architect. Sorry if I titled that incorrectly. Jennifer, are you available? Are you there? 
or Doug? Actually, I'm here. How are you? Okay. So, again, as I said before, we have a drawing that I don't know whether it's part of the presentation or not. Fairly clearly says where these four to one slopes are. The story poles are the edge of the building. The far pole you see with the with the far pole towards that house is the edge of the garage. There's a lot of undergrowth there. I don't know how Mr. Hell can determine. Did he have a tape measure? Was he just looking visually? He says it's eight feet away, maybe sixteen feet away. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. I'm sorry. If, if you're asking me, I think that was a question. Um, if you the the fencing material is four foot high, and so you can just rotate that 90 degrees to see that that's halfway to the stump. So the stump is about eight feet away. Right. My my point is is that. It's not flat. It's where it turns into a four to one slope. Again, we have a slope analysis map, Commissioner Hill, that shows exactly where this is. Now, we did talk to our structural engineers because, you know, we're not in working drawings here, but that is the edge of the driveway. Now, what we have is an opportunity because there are cases where we cannot. We've been told by the plan department we cannot build over, even if we tried to. You know, build over camp four to one slope. Even somebody says, "Well, you're not touching it. Mm -hmm. That's not allowed." So we made sure that we're not on or over. Now, if we decide at this meeting that just because I can prove on a map that we're not, even if we brought the footing back, let's say three feet, that edge of that driveway would cantilever, but it wouldn't cantilever over a four to one slope. That way, you could say, "Hey, you're going to backfill. You're going to dig a footing, but you're not going to touch. Not even touch." You could even put a construction fence on there. We could even put something that would protect the ESHA. It's not even an ESHA in Point Doom, as we all know, but we're going to call it that just for this, the, the four to one slopes. So we can do a lot of these things that we've done before, but I'm just telling you the map shows it correctly. And it's 100% it has to be correct. It's a license survey. We use them all the time. Mm -hmm. So this is just the way it is. It may look like this, but this is the way it sits. And it does work, but if we want to, because that's a retaining wall at the edge of a driveway, if we want to, we can easily, with, with the approval of this commission, say that the footing on that is not at that point. Let's say it's three or four feet back, so you're not digging or trenching into any part of a four to one slope, if that makes you happier. Well, let, let, me, let me back up here just for a sec and ask. Who else on the city staff has actually gone around the backside of this and looked at the slope? Because to me, this is this is a slam dunk. If if you're telling me that the it's all about the survey and not that you know, for example, the story poles were put in the wrong place inadvertently or whatever, then I would have to reply that the survey is a lie. It's a graphical lie. It does not. Consp I mean, when you get to the left side of that. Uh, stump there, the slope drops away precipitously. It's not, you're not walking down the slope at that point, you're climbing. So, you know, it's, I, 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 I don't know who, who's responsible for that, but that's what I see here. That's what I walked on. That's what I experienced. Has, has staff actually gone beyond this fence to actually see what's out there? Craig, you do realize that the the area that you're talking about, where the garage is there. No, no, that's the house. The garage is, from this point of view, the garage is behind us. Oh, got you. Okay. Yeah. Understood. Right? And there's a, there's a little, little bit of issue over on the garage side, but it's not it's not as, as clear cut as right here. So I just focused on this one spot. So, okay, what's, what's the other, what's the other uh, issue or challenge aside from this? Okay. <clears throat> um, all right, let's talk about the, the, the minor mod setback. Um, the prior house didn't have a driveway that wrapped around to the backside. And there was a suggestion in the staff report that the the minor mod is needed because the driveway is wrapping, wrapping around to the back side. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily a connection to make directly. It's kind of a red herring because, because they've put the driveway around the side of the house, 
they have not taken advantage of the full side yard setback that they could otherwise. So in other words, if the driveway stayed on the front side of the house, the house could be wider and further away from the street. Um, and to be clear, the, the, the original house was 3120, 3,120 square feet, approximately based on an aerial interpolation. They're asking for 6,498 square feet now. So that's over 200% of, of what was on the site before. So we're talking about this as a Woolsey, but it's you know not a like for like plus 10, it's, it's over 200%. And it would actually be more if you counted the, the full uh, square footage of the 2,600 some square foot basement, um, be more like 250%-ish. Um, so, Looking at the the minor mod, it's it's not really that minor in the front side. Uh, and you could sort of talk about neighborhood character in an informal way. That's not an SPR analysis, but um, counting the closest properties. I know staff did an example with uh, sites up and down the road, but if we count the eight closest setbacks, four four on each side of the road. Uh, and counting that we just approved a 65 foot setback next door to this proposed 31 foot setback. Um, the average of the eight closest setbacks is 73 feet. There are two short ones at 17 feet. Those are on the other side of the street. The average of just the closest four on, on the applicant's side is 51 feet with the shortest being 40 feet. So it feels like the setback here to be fitting in with the standard on that side of the street would be at least 40 feet. Otherwise, we're we're now starting to crowd that part of the, the turn there. Um, but again, if they weren't wrapping around to the back side of the house, they wouldn't need to be doing the the uh, the setback because they'd have more side yard setback that they could take advantage of. So that's that's a concern. Um, Uh, let's see, on, on ESHA, what's going on with my notes here? Here we I, go. I think it's important to note that I believe the ESHA consideration on Point Doom is no longer there. Is that? Uh, it, well, no, it's it's more complicated than that. There's several issues. Basically, ESHA on Point Doom, we talk about four to one slopes instead of ESHA, instead of ESHA, right? But... Um, Trying to find the code sections here. Uh, LIP 4.72 basically equates those four to one slopes with ESHA and says that they should be treated presumptively as ESHA. Um, and we have, then if we're talking about ESHA, we have that language that we ran into at our last meeting where you need to be setting it back to the maximum extent feasible. Clearly we haven't done that. Um, although uh, we, 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 we I, just, are... I, I don't think that that's the clear and that's the direct interpretation that many people have gone along with on point doom for a long time. Um, well, it, it's it's four to one. You have to treat it as ESHA in terms of what you can and can't plant in. I it. very much understand not right? touching the four to one slope. Yeah. Right. Okay. So we've got that there. Um, we have. One of the one of the problems here is that, and I, Adam and I tried to discuss this a little bit. Um, there's a difference between when you've got that four to one. There's a difference between the city biologist telling you what are native plants that you can put in a landscaping plan with irrigation, which is development, versus what you could put on a four to one slope here. That's you know we'll call it quasi esha, which if you wanted to be planting things out there, you'd be doing in effect, a restoration plan. And if you're doing restoration rather than landscaping here, you would not necessarily be putting tall trees like uh, oaks or uh, sycamores that are, are native and grow other places in Malibu, but were not commonly found right here on this part of the point. So that raises, that, that leads into concerns about fire. And, you know, this particular spot 
other other houses on the street didn't burn, but this one, because of the way it's situated next to the gully and the way that that slope <laughs> is aligned with the pre prevailing direction of the Santa Ana winds, it just came straight up that slope right up at this house. So it just seems like as a matter of prudence, you want to, wouldn't want to be putting a lot of tall trees on that slope. You'd want to be minimizing any planting. Um, and similarly, I don't know that there, this is more a question of policy and not so much law, but the we have from the street to the driveway about 150 feet. And fire code says that normally when you have more than one house, you need a hammerhead at anything over 150 feet. And here they, they say when it's only one house, then it's up to the official's discretion whether to put a hammerhead. And um, Doug did refer to there being a hammerhead in the back, but the standard dimension of hammerhead is 70 feet along one length, along the sort of the dual handled, the, the dual headed part of the hammer is 70 feet. And what we have here on the driveway as that width is fo about 40 feet. So it's not really a proper fire department turnaround. And I don't think they, they didn't require it because it's it's a single house and they had the discretion not to put it in there. But as a matter of, you know, just prudence, it, it seems like they're really pushing the limit there with a house that's backed up against a gully that is, you know, clearly in line with uh, the Santa Ana fire situation. So that, that you know, that's a touchy thing. And we could, we could argue about what, how significant that is, but... I'm I'm still stuck back at the um, the way the hillside lays there under the plan. It just it does not fit. Can I ask a question of Richard in regards to the four and one slope? My question is: Has it been policy to regularly allow irrigation and planting on a four to one slope on Point Doom? Yes or no? Yes, my understanding is that yes that we have been allowing irrigation and planting on the four to one slope 1.2? We have only with the use of native species and natives to this area, not because I know we've had this problem before, not Northern California, but local plants. Okay. So if I was going to go natives to this area, I'm looking at point doom as basically a grassland where nothing other than that, and maybe a coreopsis is that which shall be planted. Uh, and that's based on the beautiful photos that are sitting right behind me, <laughs> my desk right here. <laughs> but we're gonna keep those blurred <laughs> for the meantime. Right. So, a, lot, a lot of trees have grown up over the point over the last, you know, almost a century because there is runoff and irrigation, and you know, it's become sort of an artificial environment. But it isn't yes, it's it's quite not. interesting to see how some of the streams that even in the dry season had been dry are wet. Yeah. And I would have to think that that might have something to do with the amount of irrigation that goes on upstream. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know, because I'm not a an, water engineer, but just inclination. In any event, um, if it's been common practice to allow some irrigation in those native plantings in that area, I would see it hard fit to say all of a sudden now you can't do it if that's what's been allowed. And uh, just for my own sake, I might consider doing some planting on my own four to one slope, <laughs> of course, with an improved landscape plan. <laughs> Although I think right now down there, the only thing that grows is the grass that I was referencing and maybe some cactus. And uh, I, should add, I should add on that subject that the plans, some of the pages show what looks like a stairway or a, a developed pathway that goes to kind of, I think, a remote patio or something down near the stream. I was going to actually ask a question about that. And I that's, a drain, that that's, a drainage drainage. That, that's a drainage device. That's a drainage yeah, device. That's a drainage device. Yeah, that's what I thought. The house. Yeah, that's what, I, that's what it looks like to me. You got to put a dissipator down there to catch all the water. Because mm -hmm. you're in the ASBS and it can't that's, go off the property. That's a dissipator. All right. But yeah, yeah. dissipator. Um, in regards to the question about the fire department, I mean, was this, uh, Adam, was this not approved by the fire department? They obviously had clear look at these plans and the purview to say they could add something else. But they didn't. And they approved yeah. it. 
it, it was approved. I'm just uh, pulling up the approval so I can have the exact uh, language so in front of me here. Technically, it's approvable. It's just really borderline. Yeah, but I don't believe that that's not our purview. That's the fire department's yeah. purview. Yeah. Um, I know that Doug has a beautiful flashing hand, and he probably wants to add something along those lines because that's when I saw it go up. Did you want to add something, Doug? Yes, hi. Let me just ask the clarification. Yes, Commissioner Hill, I mentioned Hammerhead. I meant to say um, that's an access for them around the house. The way the rule works with the fire department <clears throat> is that if you can prove that you have a three a maximum three hundred foot spur from the public way, which is the street which is what we have, and we show have on a fire department approved plan, then you get out of your truck and you can walk back some 150 feet in one direction. And then if your truck is staged on the street, 150 feet from that other direction around all structures, then you comply with the walk around five foot open to the sky, 300 feet max distance to where the fire truck would then back out. So we don't need a hammerhead or a turnaround on this property and we were careful to design the project accordingly. That was the first thing we figured out when we did this design. So that clears that up, hopefully. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, but you know, to, to my mind, again, this is this is all like deck chairs on the Titanic compared to that, the, the terrain back there. It okay. just doesn't work. I was gonna ask a question of Patrick. So, and I don't, or, or Dennis or Jeff for that matter is I, very much understand from the photo what Craig is bringing up in regards to the four to one slope situation in the driveway based. I thought that the photo was from the garage. So I was like, hey, that's the road's not right there. But how do we clarify that um, in this situation? If it was something where like, hey, can we go look at that? We get, I'm not going to, you know, I mean, how is that very, how, or how are those story poles verified in regards to the location and the slope four to one, meeting the four to one slope stuff on point two? Yeah, you know, as you know, uh, Commissioner Peak, they, they've got to find a benchmark out in the street, then they start their measurements. So they they go through and they they plot all the things that, that Mr. Burge has given them, because he draws up the, the, the story ball plan, right? And then they, they, they take their information and then they plot it throughout the lot with setbacks and all that. So what you end up with is a verified plan where the poles are that fit the lot the way that it is. They have that has to be certified. You can't. It's not just okay, like so you go I, out. Hang on. It. It's not like Mr. Hill or Commissioner Hill had mentioned. It's a it's a lie. That was a pretty strong statement. I'm well, sure. Yeah. Hang on. I'm pretty sure that was. It wasn't needed. However, when survey goes out there, they're licensed. This isn't taking the stump and figuring out where it is eight feet. Now, what makes this bad, as far as I'm concerned, is the homeowner didn't, didn't have the wherewithal to clean this. The guys went out with the story poles. That was that's not very good as far as I'm concerned. However, um, we do have them in a place that there are stakes that says where they go, and this is how the house is set up. And if the house had this setback originally, um, this is what they're doing. If they want their garage in the back, Commissioner Hill, they can put their garage in the back. They've made all this, the fire department has, it works for them with 150 foot hose lay that, that Mr. Birch just described. There's nothing wrong with this. So it is, it's set where the house goes. However, I'm looking at the gradient lines here and they don't seem to fall off quite as quick as you're saying, but with all that growth, you know, it's hard to say how far, how it falls off. However, this is set up and verified and it has to be that way. And nobody, nobody makes these things up. It's okay. that house is set where it's set. I, I understand all that. Let me just say, if, if, if it's about the story poles, maybe something happened, like for example, they were supposed to have measured from the edge of the street and instead they measured from the edge of the easement. And, and then that would, that would, potentially re yield a result putting the story poles 10 feet closer to the cliff than they but, should be but, but the, story, the story poles just don't go willy-nilly they go right where the pin is okay. and next to the stake right and, and i agree generally that's the case and if that is indeed it's true always then, the case then i stand by my assertion therefore that the 
survey is a graphical lie. It is does not co correspond to the land out there. It's just wrong. I I, I was it, the brush didn't occlude me from seeing and looking down and seeing. I could not. It's not a, anything you could walk down. It, it's steep. You have to climb down that. It's just you know I, I'm not I'm not selling a product here or something. I just went out and saw what's there. I don't look. No one's disputing what you saw. If that's what you saw, that's what you saw. I just was, I, Dennis. What I was going to ask is, how are we assured that, like, I want to I, I want to support this project. I think that they designed a very good project here. I just want to be able to assure that we're not encroaching into that four and one slope. And what I'm asking is, like, what mechanism or anything do we have here to do that? That's all. Really, what my question is. You have a you have a, you have a letter from the from a. Uh licensed surveyor that says this is where the house goes and this is the measurements to get it there it's like you and i we have to give guarantees you and i have a guarantee i've got one on structural for 10 years right so we have things that we have to live by right or wrong but this this is, this is people that work with those itty bitty numbers and i joke to them all the time if you're making an eighth or a quarter it'd be a lot easier however these are small numbers that these men and women work with to make this stuff so it's right where it's supposed to go there's not the poles are next to the stake next to the pin that's they, they don't just come out and, and offset or or move that's where it sets dennis I, I understand you understand the process and the law and the rules and everything perfectly well and i agree that's how it should be that's how it should be you haven't been out on the site you have not seen what's actually there it's just not it's not what's on paper I, I don't want to argue about it any further. I think I've made my point, you know, so. I believe I've made mine. Jeff? You're muted. So we usually have a color-coded slope analysis and I'm looking at sheet one, which is the only thing I've got that kind of looks like it might be that. Everything I've got on the, the set of plans that we were given is in black and white. There isn't much of a coded, uh, color coded analysis. This is the one. Um, this is the one where, isn't it, where they said, uh, "Yeah, we sent black and white, and in, and if you want a color one, we'll we'll get you one." I'm looking. I'm looking at, I'm looking um, at the color on the PDF. So. Is there? Excuse me. Is there a staff? Is there a color coded uh, version that you can? Book? put up on the screen if there is a color one there is i can send one to alex right now okay thank you so that's that i'll wait until uh you get that up so i can comment on that um so going back to the issue of four to one slopes uh you, uh, what i what i see going on is that is that there was a, there was a trade-off during the hearings when the Coastal Commission um, uh, wrote our LCP. And the trade-off was four to one slopes or ESHA. And so what I hear you guys saying is, oh, well, it's four to one slope, but they're really ESHA. So you want them both. You want both ESHA and four to one slopes. But that clearly was not what was happening at the Coastal Commission at the time this was adopted. It was, we're not gonna talk about Usha, oh, but four to one slope, she can't encroach on it. That was the deal. And the the only Usha on the point, I think is, is as we pointed out the other day, was over in that um, corner of a, a gully where, uh, Westward, uh, where uh, the restaurant is. Um, secondly, there's a, there's a bit of subtle change about a minor modification and how that came about. I, I've heard you, Craig, in the past say, that, well, I think we ought to treat minor modifications much more like variances. And, and that's not really how it came about. When the development standards and the setback requirements were being debated and put into place, the city council actually did some very wise things. They realized that there were all kinds of shapes and sizes of lots in Malibu, and you really couldn't just come up with one cookie cutter number that would fit everything. And so a minor modification 
was allowed as a relief back for, you know, if you wanted to move your house forward or you wanted to move it on the side, as long as you weren't destroying or adversely affecting the uh, the neighborhood character, whatever the uh, um, the, the term and the, and the finding is, um, then you could do that as long as you didn't go over the halfway point. And it was just to allow some flexibility in the design. It wasn't supposed to be, oh, no, you've got to have this house set back this much or else, you know, the world is going to come to an end. It was designed for flexibility. And particularly in this case, the house itself, you're talking about how much the house is set back when you look at the neighbors and all the rest of that stuff. In this case, the house itself is set back the amount that's required. It's only the, sh the surf shack and the trellis that intrude into that setback area. So um, I think it's, I, I would find it very difficult uh, to be persuaded that the, uh, the existence of the surf shack and the trellis somehow uh, deleteriously affect uh, neighborhood character. Um, and then we've already talked about the fire department. I, that was the other point I was gonna make. So did you have something that you, some people were putting up uh, the color-coded soap analysis? I've sent it over. It, it should be up in momentarily. Can, can I ask, okay. Commissioner Jennings can ask a question on, on that. On When we had the uh, the one over on Port's Head not terribly long ago, um, I recall you being very concerned about the extent to which that driveway hung out over the slope. And it, and it wasn't until we were assured by the architect that actually it, it wasn't touching it at all, that it was going to be cantilevered by, cantilevered by a few feet that, you know, you said, okay, well, that, that'll work. But prior to that understanding, it sounded like we were all concerned. And here, there's a retaining wall on that slope that's going to be pretty substantial. And I, I think that's pretty well prohibited. So I, I'm not sure how you- Well, I wonder, uh, that's, that's my question. Uh... Craig, as to whether or not that retaining wall is on the four to one slope or not. Uh, and I'm sorry, now I've got a chance to look at it and I see that this is the, uh, this is the, the, the sheet that I was looking at in black and white. Yeah. Um, and where's the color code? So what it, what it shows is it just, just to the uh, north of the, um, of the edge of the, of the driveway is what a sort of a salmon color. Where's the, where's the keys? You can't find the key. It, is it possible to zoom in on this at all, Alex? And if you can maybe zoom in on the key to start and then we can Either zoom on in. on the bottom on left, Commissioner yeah. Jones, of that map. Yeah, it's pretty hard to read. Thank you, Alex. In, okay, it, it looks like salmon is 10% of that's a two to one. And then the the lighter green is minimum slope four to one, maximum slope three to one. What does that mean? Um, can you zoom out? I'm sorry. Um, yeah, this, the salmon is from two to one to one to one. Yeah. And the, the way they've drawn it here, they've got that backed up directly against the retaining wall. But when you look at the section plans, you, you see the retaining wall is the slope is already starting down. Well, I would think that uh, I would think that they're, that they're putting the retaining wall right at the edge of the driveway, right? Is that not right? Yes. And this is a variable. And so, and so it's just a question of, of, of you know, I hate to get into these situations because basically we're what we're supposed to be doing is is having the licensed experts come to us and tell us what the situation is, and yeah. and then we go out and measure it on our own and say, well, it looks this like I'm uncomfortable with that, frankly. Uh, I think our job is to you know is to is to first of all to, to do otherwise it puts us in the same territory where you are which is that this surveyor is either incompetent or a liar. And I, you know, that's very tough for me to take. I can't, I can't, uh, I, I've got basically this guy's license and your pictures of a depot and a, and a stump. I don't know, I, I have a difficult time 
I, I agree too. And I, I have a hard time saying it's exactly that reason. I'm just saying there's there's a discontinuity somewhere and whether it's the analysis or the polls or, or you know, that it, it just doesn't add up on the ground. Well, I, 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 what, what do you what do you think the solution is? To just deny if they, the project? If they, if they move the project closer, that back corner, ten feet closer to the street, they could make it work. Well, no, but no, you're assuming you're right. <laughs> I, yeah, so, I am so, assuming I'm right. I am right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah. See, forgive me, but I have a little bit of a problem with that. I mean, one, one option here would be to uh, continue it and have staff, anybody that wants to walk out there and look at it. But you're, I'm not interested in people walking out and, and eyeballing it. What I'm interested in is surveyors. And ordinarily what I would say, well, if you had an objection to this survey, you should have had a survey and, and come in and say, you know, show the surveys wrong. Well, I understand I that. Mean, I, I, in my mind, this is the, 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 the licensed survey gets a presumption. That yeah. needs to be overcome. Yeah, and when you have a project opponent, typically they would be asked if they want to, you know, invited to bring their own surveyor to look at it and compare it. But this isn't quite that circumstance. And that's a great. Okay, so Jennifer, a, Jennifer's the, got her hand up. She, she, Jennifer's the project uh, uh, manager, I assume. And uh, let me ask her if she's got any information that could help us out with the survey issue. Yeah. Can you unmute her? I. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, thanks for your time. I just wanted to shed a little light on this as well. Obviously, as we spoke about before, this lot, while it's quite deep, there's only a very limited amount of space that is actually a buildable pad. So to your point, we were very, very conscious when we designed this, this project to start from the first moment that we could build, right? And that gave us our buildable pad. So we backed up and we worked backwards from that point. So you can see that we are bordering that not those non-buildable slopes, working backwards, making sure we have the, the 20 feet, then putting the house as close as we could, while also trying to maintain that front yard setback. As you guys um, mentioned earlier, we, we did everything we could to um, meet all the, the regulations of this lot. We tried to meet the front yard setback. We tried to meet the four to one slope, which I would argue we did here with everything that we have to our knowledge from licensed surveyors, from all of our expertise, from all of the many different people who reviewed this over the last two years that we've been in the planning process. You know, we, we reviewed this over and over. Um, to your point, you know, we could have put the garage in the front yard setback, but we felt this was a better use of the property and less disturbance to the neighbors to put a very shallow trellis in the front versus a larger garage in the front yard setback. So again, everything we're doing here is to tr is trying to have the most minimal impact on the site. Um, and again, all we can go off of is this color coded slope band analysis was slope band analysis, excuse me, which was the origin of every design element you see here. Um, so as opposed to just starting over with a new slope band analysis, I don't know what more we could do to prove to you that we've attempted to follow every regulation here. Right. What, what, when what, you, I, when you go, when you, excuse me, when you go forward with, with the, the, the process, what, what is the process of delineating the, 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 the northernmost development elements, the, 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 the edge of the, the, I guess it's the retaining wall. Right. Absolutely. There. Right. Uh, so the very first thing we do and when we start any project is we get the survey and the very first thing we ask for before we design anything is the color coded slope band analysis. And that's the first thing we tell any clients because we will not design without it. So again, everything here, we set that retaining wall on the border, make sure that we have L shaped footings, not T shaped footings. So we're not going into there. Uh, we're, we're doing everything we can to respect that, that boundary. But again, if you say, well, we could push it back 10 feet, well, what's the arbitrary number that is gonna, that's gonna accept that, right? If, if we can't go by what a licensed surveyor has told us, and you're saying we can push it back 10 feet, well, would five feet do? Would 15 feet do? Like what's going to, if, if we don't have any scientific 
licensed document to prove that we're complying, you know, th th that's the origin yeah. of the entire design. Well, I, I came up with the top right. number just because it's pretty easy to see the stump is about eight feet based on the height of the, the fencing material. And, and then it drops off the other side of the stump. So, you know, give or take roughly the, the difference we're talking about here is about 10 feet. Another thought, and I don't know how, how plausible this is, but maybe this survey was done in 2021. Uh, if there had been some sort of um, cataclysmic slumping of, of the edge of the, that, I don't know what we call it, it's not a bluff per se, or maybe it is. Uh, but if, if that had slumped some bit, then I guess the brush that's on there would not have grown back in time to be as as big as it is. So, but, you know, stuff grows quickly. I'm always surprised at how fast things grow around here. So, you know. And we've had 27 inches of rain this year. Yeah, exactly. So I don't know. I mean, if, if that thing slumped five feet, say, uh, it, maybe it doesn't need to be the full 10 feet. Maybe it was five feet. Maybe that would account for how it's different now, but it just doesn't, you know, that, if it was as recent as 2021, that also seems unlikely. Well, all right. Thank you, Jennifer. Okay. Um, Dennis? I'll make a motion. I was going to make a motion to approve the project. I mean, absent some site survey that shows me something catastrophically different than what's here, this is what we have to go off of. So, um, make a motion to adopt Planning Commission Resolution 23-25 and all the other numbers that go along with that. And be very certain in the conditions of the project that no development is to occur in any part of the four to one slope aside from the said uh, irrigation and drainage line. How, how tall is that retaining wall supposed to be in the end? Just by way of checking it in the future. A couple feet, right? I think you can see that on that uh, A3.0. Yeah, that's a couple feet or maybe three feet. Yeah, it's not very high. Three feet, three and three quarter inches. Yeah, I, I, I'll be interested to see that when, when this project is done. I, I'm, I'm going to guess it's twice as high as that. <clears throat> well, let's hope not. I don't think that Doug likes to mess with a four and one slope. And the, the inspectors <laughs> let that go, Commissioner Hill. Nobody's going to, they're not going to be able to do that. It's on the plan. Please. Well, it, it, if they're like you, they'll say, gee, this has a lot of inertia. Let's just say yes, because that'll make everyone. That's, a, that's, a, that's an incorrect statement. When the inspectors come out, they have a set of plans. They'll look at it. If it's taller than it's supposed to be, then it won't be there. It's that simple. You, you and Commissioner Mazza have the wrong idea about how stuff works. Don't don't group me with him on this. Uh, you just made me, but go ahead. <laughs> so I'll second the motion. <clears throat> and would you like me to call the roll? Please. Commissioner Peak. Yes. Can, Chair Smith. Yes. Commissioner Hill. No. Commissioner Jennings. Yes. Motion carries. Make the motion to adjourn. I'll move that. Roll call, please. My apologies. A motion to adjourn from Commissioner Peak. From uh, Chair Smith. Chair Smith, thank you. Um, Chair Smith. Seconded by me. Yeah, seconded by Commissioner uh, Jenny. Or yeah. Thank uh, you. Yes. Yes. Jotting down the <laughs> record for the last one while not listening carefully enough. So, Chair Smith. Yes. Commissioner Jennings. Yes. Commissioner Hill. Yes. Commissioner Peak. Yes. You are adjourned. Thank you. Go out and look at it, guys. Wear your heavy boots and long pants because there's a lot of foxtails. I'll be there tomorrow. Do it. Do it. Check it out. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone.